Okay, next we'll go to girls basketball. So as I ca call your name, please come up. Uh, Talia Banha. <laughs> LJ Holland. Zoe Jagodinsky. Kaylee Lewis. Evian Owens. Tyrus Patrick. Shania Riviera. Abijah Scaife. Kenzie Shoneman. Sila Smith. Alicia Abara. And Alexis Abara. And we have Coach Baca from West Wind. And as Coach Wynn is coming up to present on behalf of Coach Baca, um, girls, I watched a lot of games, and I was so impressed with uh, the way you play, um, making it to the state playoffs, um, you know, and uh, traveling up and playing playing a tough game. Uh, super proud of, of the, the, the growth and the work that you guys did, and um, for seniors that are leaving, you've left a legacy behind, and for the younger players coming up, you, you have a, a, a platform set, and now you build upon it. So congratulations. You guys had a great season. Um, her and Coach Bonner are at a middle school game tonight, um, coaching kids who hopefully someday will be up here in front of you guys. So from Coach Baca, she just wanted everyone to know that the girls had an overall record of 11 to 7. They made the playoffs, so lost to Chinle uh, in the first round. And we had four All-State honors this year, first team All-Region, Alexa Sabara and CeCe Smith. Region was Titleist Patrick. And honorable mention was Alicia Abar. Coach, coach, coach the coins. Did you win the coins? So the coins that we give out are uh, for academics, athletics, and the arts, and it's excellence in one of those three categories. And I know a lot of you hit all three, and if not all of you, do a lot of different things on our campus. So we appreciate all that. So that is the, the challenge coin for you to, as a commemorative uh, piece of you know, your recognition tonight. So if you want to scoot down and let George take your picture, congratulations. Spencer Nelson, <laughs> Nefaria Stoka Johnson, Sam Barnard, Dito Geiger, Matthew Haney, Tyler Cosman, Lucas Greco, Luke Plano, Aiden Logan, Jack Irvin, Keaton Ort. Jake Zuberbuehler and Casey Osborne. And as we're getting ready to prepare, um, I've known a lot of you for a long time, and it's so awesome to see you up here. Um, you guys have left something that's never been done before, uh, which is to head into the state playoffs with an undefeated record, and that is impressive considering <laughs> The, the tradition in this, this program. So excellent job overall. Um, you guys had a, just a great season. And again, for a lot of you seniors that are, are leaving, you've left a, a legacy behind and you've left the program in great shape. And for the younger players coming up, um, it's your time now to build upon this and continue uh, building forward. So congratulations on a great season. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, Coach Bonner's um, speech is a little longer than Coach Bonner's. So <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> um, he said, first, I would like to start by thanking you on behalf of our entire program. We know without the support we get, we wouldn't be able to do half the things we do. A lot of you won't believe me, but we feel the need of your support more than you could ever know. We had another great season filled with highs and lows. Any 20 plus win season is an accomplishment and this group of guys did it while only losing one game the whole year. Unfortunately, that loss came in the corner finals, which was the end of our run at the state championship. That is our goal every year and continues to be that way until I believe we have, and I believe we have the ability to get there and win it. For the first time in school history, the boys and our coaching staff achieved an undefeated season and captured a region championship in the process. We had three all-state selections this year, six all-region selections, and a region coach of the year, as well as region player of the year. We had a lot of fun throughout the season and look forward to a lot more success in the future. We have nine seniors leaving us this year and we truly will miss every one of them. For the returners, we will have big shoes to fill, but with the leadership from our seniors, he believes that the guys will be ready to go and he's excited for the off season and the season to come next year. Great job, gentlemen. That's it for our district celebration. Congratulations to all of you. Uh, next up is public comments. Do we have public comments, Krista? I do. <clears throat> Call to the public. Uh, this is the time for the public to comment. Time limits may be allocated on public comment at the discretion of the board president for the board to efficiently complete its business. The board reserves the right to prohibit any comments made in a discourteous or threatening manner. Complaints about specific individuals, student, or personnel are discouraged. Personnel issues should be directed to the appropriate staff member or administrator per district policy. Members of the board may not discuss items that are not specifically identified on the agenda. Therefore, pursuant to ARS 38-431.01H, action taken as a result of public comment will be limited to directing staff to study the matter, responding to any criticism, or scheduling the matter for further consideration at a, and a, at a later date. <clears throat> um, before I call anyone to talk, I, I know that several of you are here um, regarding Coach Hughes, and you are more than welcome to come up and, and make your comments. But as I just read, I just encourage you to keep your comments positive, to not Discourt, be discourteous to any other staff member and and you will be limited to a three minute time limit that is uh, custom for the board when we have several public comments so I, I just ask that you keep your comments positive and directed towards your coach and not other personnel <clears throat> first up is um, Caroline Hales <laughs> Up to the podium. I have it on my phone. Pull the mic towards you. The, the tall one. There, there you, you go. go. That's perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Caroline Hills. I'm number 13 on the softball team. I'm here to talk about the character of our coach Lawrence Hughes and how much this man means to us and how much he's helped us so much and that it would be a tragedy to lose him. First of all, I'm going to talk about me a little bit. I started my softball career at a very young age in Alabama. I... Okay. And so when I moved here, I was very nervous because I thought I wouldn't fit in that It'd be really hard, but Coach swept me up and treated me like family right away. It made me make this place feel a little bit more like home. He cares about us, and he only did what he did to help us. Was it wrong? Yes. Was it done for the right reason? Absolutely. And that was so we could play, and we as a team supported the decision. We know we wouldn't get to play if we didn't. We did not mean to hurt anyone this season. Has, this season has been hard on everyone, especially Coach. We were just playing and having fun. The team we beat still win, 
to win the tournament. Coach really wanted us to play. His intentions were to make sure we were all safe and ready for the region's games the following week. He never had any bad intentions, and anyone is, it was just supposed to be a fun weekend as a softball team. Let's extend grace to Coach because his heart was in the right place for his girls. Fountain Hills softball team is a family, and we stick together, and we were always there for each other. Okay, next up, um, Adriana. Just, uh, I've been, Lawrence has been my coach ever since second grade, ever since the Fountain Hills Little League, and um, ever since then, um, he's treated us like family, and I am in eighth grade only, but um, I've been playing with him ever since uh, seventh grade uh, for the school, and he's always treated us like family, and I've met a lot of girls there that I just, that really, he brought us all together as a team, and it was really just exciting and it was so much fun just being able to play softball with each other and I had a lot of fun with Little League and everything like that and um, I hope a lot of grace goes to our coach and everything like that but I'm, I was very glad for all the seasons that we had with each other and all of the family that we were with together. Thank you. Anastasia Kershaw. So hi, I'm Anastasia Kershaw. I'm going to speak on behalf of my husband because he had to leave with my baby. Um, we've known Lawrence for quite a really long time. He has been a pillar of this community. For he has brought all these girls up since they were first grade kindergarten and brought them to be a family and be so strong and what happened was wrong. Yes, were the intentions good? Yes. Do we need to give grace to everybody that we love and care? We should. I understand that there are procedures and everything like that, but he is an amazing person. He loves this community more than a lot of people do. He volunteers not only his time, his effort, but he treats everybody with so much love and respect and dignity. And, you know, we were brand new to coming into softball, and he has, I have six kids. He has created a love for all of them that now is moving on and is going to be going on through this school. And I just want you guys to understand how important he has been to not only this community, but to the school, to the sport, and to all of these girls. He loves them more than a lot of people would put their effort and their time into. And I'm just going to read what my husband said because he had to go. He said, you know, Lawrence is a stand-up person. He puts everybody else before he puts himself. He's a vibrant contributor to this community. Um, he is very generous with not only his time and his, his devotion to the girls, but he has one of the biggest hearts. And we love you, Lawrence. It's all I can really say, and I really, 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 truly hope you guys can find it within the grace to dig deep, I don't know, and if there's a way possibly around it, but I, I hope that we can find something. Thank you. Thank you. Heather Chandler. I'm here today on behalf of Coach Hughes. 
I really don't think you understand how detrimental this would be to this pro this district and this community. This man gives his all. He has a heart of gold. I would do anything for these kids. In fact, if you ever talk with him, everything he ever says is all about the kids. I know I have known Coach Hughes for at least 10 years, and he's coached my daughter for the last six or more of those. It is because of him that she has a love for softball, plays club, and wants to continue, continue on through college and get a scholarship in which he is helping us navigate the overwhelming process about that. I don't know what the situation is around the Shogun decision or what the rush is, but know that you have awakened the sleeping giant. Because of this rash decision, you are messing with these girls' lives. You have completely messed up our seniors, our only senior softball season. Um, the stats of these girls are going to get messed up, in which some of them are number one in the region currently. Playtime for these kids, possible college recruitment opportunities. You have torn these kids down to the point that they are confused and upset and don't know what to think. And you think just by picking some random person to potentially coach for the remainder of the season makes it this all better. It does not, because these girls will not get the attention, influence, practice that they so deserve. It will be a warm body pretending they care, but, and it is not fair. Without Coach Hughes at the helm, this district will lose a whole softball program from middle school up through high school, as there are parents and students who are currently playing that won't play on or will move to other districts because he is not their coach. This district does not need any more students leaving because someone made a decision in the matter of 24 hours. I understand Coach Hughes made it an error in judgment, but it was out of good intentions to ensure that if any of our players needed some relief, they had it, especially knowing we are going into regional games starting this week. His character is being questioned due to false allegations of someone telling you that he told girls to lie, which he absolutely did not. The actions being taken by this district are very extreme. Um, why would we want to eliminate a coach that loves the kids, the game, and is willing to do so much for the program, the community, and many times on his own dime? You need to rethink your decision and please dig deep down in your hearts as a school board and look at the bigger picture of what this could do with this district. Thank you. Thank you. Robin Bratcher. Hello, everybody. I am speaking on behalf of Coach Hughes. I've had the pleasure of knowing Lawrence for almost 20 years. His heart and soul beats for all the Falcons in this community and their future. If you've ever had the chance to talk with him, you would know that. Lawrence has coached Little League Baseball, Pee Wee Football, Middle School Softball, High School Softball, and Middle School Baseball. He is famously known for telling the kids to smile while playing and just have fun. Our eldest son was lucky enough to have him as a coach in Middle School Baseball. Lawrence has given our sons bats, gloves, and training tools to use from his own personal collection. During each game, you would constantly hear Lauren Coach Hughes talking to his players and guiding them through each play, cheering them on, win or loss. His practices were organized and thought out, covering each position, play, and developing their skills. I've witnessed that during softball games, little league games, and baseball games. We, you know, we all know in this district, you don't coach for the money, you coach for the love of the game and your players. I'm pretty sure Lawrence's heart is either in the shape of a baseball or a softball. Um, okay, I lost my place looking at you guys. In addition, during uh, middle school baseball and softball season, in an effort to raise funds for both programs, Lawrence made weekly trips to the store to be able to stock the snack shack, and when his girls didn't have a game, you would see him grilling hamburgers and cheeseburgers to sell in an effort to bring in extra money for the programs. You see, Lawrence has not relied solely on the Booster Club for funding. His softball program, he fundraises or spends his own money. We lack so many volunteers in our district and people willing to go the extra mile in supporting our kids, but not from Lawrence Hughes. 
This district would not only suffer a loss without him coaching and volunteering, but it would only perpetuate the divide that we see in this district already. Right now, we have a coach still coaching that had a player severely injured during practice by overlooking the player's safety, with no, no notification to the parent or halt in practice at the time of the in incident. Well, we have Coach Hughes that brought an ineligible player to a charity softball event as a sub to give some relief and rest to the team to prevent injury and watch out for his player's safety, and he has been dismissed at the moment. Is this a double standard? We have all made mistakes in life, and I believe Lawrence has owned up and admitted to his mistake. His punishment doesn't fit the repercussions he has faced. If Lawrence is indeed terminated, we will lose a coach that has a passion for the game and the players, personally fundraises for his team, always has a smile on his face, and is always willing to go the extra mile for any athlete or Falcon. And then Adam, is that your husband? And so he's no longer here. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you to all of you. I, I know that was very heartfelt, and uh, and I appreciate you coming and speaking. Next up, uh, information discussion items. And also, if you if you ladies have homework to do, you you can certainly be dismissed. You don't have to listen to the finance section. So. Uh, but you're welcome to stay if you want to. <laughs> Next up, information discussion items. Um, we're going to start with the finance discussion. Um, as I sent my email yesterday, I hope you all read. So this is just a discussion. It's more of an information gathering um, that we just felt was necessary um, based on some requests, uh, you know, several FOIAs, direct requests, um, you know, Lillian had made the comment at the last board meeting about getting more information. And so um, we would just like to uh, have an information discussion item, give Tyler an opportunity to talk about uh, the uh, consolidation uh, procurement. So we can start with that, Tyler. So then after that, we'll, we'll continue our information gathering. Um, but that way you don't have to stay the whole time either and you know then once we gather our information then we'll have you come to a meeting and kind of work out those those items yeah so thank you president Reed, members of the board dr. J um, yeah like you mentioned it invited here to speak a little bit about finance um, I wanted to cover um, first consolidation procurement as you, the board is going to start seeing some um, procurement items come to you for approval for the consolidation um, and so I wanted to talk through some of those um, procurement options that the district is exercising um, in, in looking to uh, get best value um, for this consolidation project so and then yeah of course I'll be open to answer any questions so uh, first um, as the district moves forward in the consolidation process um, we are going to have to secure a, a general contractor at some point to help with some of this um, construction um, there are various options that districts uh, and government entities have available to them. Um, and so I've listed those here in one through four. And so I'll cover those options. Um, and I'll elaborate a little bit what the district plans to do. So first, um, design, bid, build, or, or hard bid, like we kind of use, you utilize those terms interchangeably. Um, but this method is typically used for projects that have a clear scope of work um, with limited variability. This method is awarded on proposed pricing um, and essentially low price. So if we get a list of bids, we would award low price. That's stated in uh, the Arizona Procurement uh, Administrative Code. But one thing with this project, if um, this, this procurement method, is if a method is awarded on proposed pricing um, and the contractor starts to work and there is a change in the scope of work, um, that uh, basically prompts a change order and then the district is responsible for basically those additional costs um, as those weren't bid on in the original procurement. So um, using the design bid build or hard build procurement method really requires a specific scope of work. Um, and sometimes it may seem advantageous for the district to go this route, but there is um, oftentimes in construction, whether you're doing home construction or large scale construction, there's unforeseen um, items that you may not be aware of and so again if there's a clear scope of work with limited variability this is a an excellent option to, to get the best pricing um, 
when the district is bidding out a particular project. So, the second one, the construction manager at risk, um, often utilized, called CMAR, if you hear that acronym. Um, this method is typically used for projects that are over a million dollars and have several potential variables in the scope of work. A contractor is identified based on qualifications, not price. So when uh, contractors submit on a project, we review qualifications of that contractor to ensure that they have the qualifications to fulfill the, the project um, and the scope of work in the project. Um, again, the, the award is on a contractor um, based on qualifications. Um, and then we work with that contractor as well as the architect to develop basically the exact um, needs or basically dig into that scope of work and identify any variables that are, that are in that project. Um, this is all done uh, with the architect. There may be even pre-construction that it's done. So if we are um, getting into a building, we may want to look what's behind that drywall before we, the contractor gets you a price. So they go in, do some of that research and some of that assessment ahead of that. So when they do come to the board with a price on the price of that project, it's called the guaranteed maximum price, that is a guaranteed maximum price. They will not exceed. Um, there would be no change orders. Um, and so that's a price that uh, a district um, can move forward with and know they are not going to exceed that because we've done, they've done all the work um, to identify all the variables in a project. Um, this, this, again, this method is very uh, popular with large scale projects. Um, and again, I think the district will be exercising a piece of this uh, in a portion of the, pro the consolidation project. The third um, procurement method is job order contracting or JOC contracting. You'll, you're going to see a lot of acronyms in <laughs> not only budget and finance, but in, in construction as well. Um, but I've tried to list these out here so uh, you can follow along. But this method is typically used for smaller projects under a million dollars with a clear scope of work. So the district issues quotes on that scope of work um, and utilizes contractors on cooperative contracts. Uh, so job order contracting. Um, again, very popular with a clear scope of work, um, and a project costs under a million dollars. Um, the contractors that are on cooperative contracting, they have uh, pricing listed out already. Um, that pricing is competitive, um, and you can, you can basically um, uh, compare pricing against either contractor. Um, but one thing with this uh, procurement method is it does limit you on your, basically, negotiation. Um, because they're bidding off of their cooperative contract pricing that's already public. So, again, useful under for smaller projects where um, that margin of, of not error, but the margin of um, ability for the district to negotiate in a project um, is smaller because um, it may be more efficient for the district to go through this process. Um, whereas when you go to projects over a million dollars, um, this is not a uh, recommended procurement method. The last one there, cooperative purchasing. purchasing. So the school district um, procurement rules authorizes and governs, governs intergovernmental procurement. Uh, cooperative purchasing agreements have been signed with several organizations to reduce administrative du duplication and to promote best value purchasing uh, to obtain economies of scale. So Fountain Hills utilizes several cooperative contracts um, to procure items such as office supplies, custodial supplies, um, you know, these contracts are issued out for government agencies to use. Uh, and so um, when we get to talking about specifics of the consolidation project, whether it be playgrounds, fencing, um, it's more advantageous for the district to go ahead and work directly with those vendors rather than through an architect and a contractor to procure those services because we get the best value going directly to those vendors. And so to summarize that kind of all up is the district's going to be using a lot of these. Um, in particular, uh, number two, the uh, job or excuse me, yeah, number two, uh, construction manager at risk, uh, job order contracting, uh, and cooperative purchasing. Um, as we're going to continue to work with our all-in budget to try to get the best value um, for this consolidation in every single project that's involved in it. So there's very a lot of variables, um, and so we're going to work with with Dr. J. Um, and vendors, as, as long with Orcon Winslow, but if we do not need to use Orcon Winslow for engineering or architectural services, we are not, that's not the purpose of why we procured them. Um, and so what we approved, 
previously for them uh, may not all be expended, and we don't anticipate to reach, reach that as we utilize some of these other procurement methods to get the best pricing uh, for the district in this consolidation. Um, I do want to note that, again, you're going to start seeing some of these items come through. I think the first one um, is going to be playgrounds, as we're working directly with the playground vendor um, to start that project. Part of the reason is some of these have long lead items, right? And if, we're, if our goal is to get this uh, going for next school year, uh, some of these items have to start to be approved by the gun board and start to be purchased um, to have those basically ready to go for next school year. Um, and it's, it's becoming clear that uh, this consolidation project is going to be phased um, with a majority of the needs being done in phase one to make the school operational and have all the needs for the students at both um, the elementary and the middle and high school. So, uh, but cost of construction, um, timing, um, you know, this, this consolidation, in order to do it right, um, we were talking it, it's going to have to be phased. And so um, that is one reason why we'll be using various procurement methods for this project. Um, and so that's a little summary of the procurement. I don't know if Dr. Jay yeah, I'm just going to I'm just going to add that you know it's going to have to be phased because we're, we're we're not going to have enough money to get everything done in phase one. Okay, um, the square footage of some of these buildings and the spaces is massive, and so you you know I've had to come to that realization, which is sad because you know I like I have these great ideas and. They're not all going to get in, but what we are going to do is we are going to, um, for example, when we bring to you playgrounds, we may not be able to get all the equipment in phase one, but we're going to have everything in place to add playground equipment in phase two. So we may do the flooring and we may do several pieces, but maybe a, uh, you know another piece will be added in, in next year and another piece the following year so that over a period of time we have exactly what we want, this wonderful wow space that really brings excitement to our kids and brings them here. But it may not all happen in, in year one is what I'm coming to realize. There are certain things that we're prioritizing that we want to get done and um, and and it's just the reality of it. So, so there. Are, I appreciate that um, because we are going to have to get some of these projects started soon. And um, for example, the the cooperative purchasing of playgrounds. There is no need for Cut Winslow to be involved in that. Like, so we won't be paying them anything for that. Um, the company that we go with will do all that work, all that engineering. I can I can share that. The cement on that slab has already been evaluated, and it is it is set for new playground equipment. It will it will hold, and it be it is the right whatever they did years ago. They thought it out, and so it is it will be able to be done. But if it has a 16 week lead time, and we want we we need to get started now, so that hopefully by the end of September, you know that playground is open when it starts to cool down. So so we're revising um, and we're making decisions that um, you know are fiscally responsible but at the same time remember the goal of this was to to hopefully jumpstart and and continue to build upon the enrollment gains that we've had are there questions for Tyler uh, regarding the con uh, procurement next steps my only comment would be I mean, we've talked I talked to you about this a little bit with the consolidation you know we do need to be responsible with the funds you know we're limited and I think that it makes sense to kind of triage and say these things take priority and so I know that we might need to sacrifice some of the wow factor that we wanted to go for but I don't think that that's necessarily a negative especially in a small town if we can really focus on the product that we offer which is more than the buildings and more than the wow factor it really is the community and the, you know the close-knit atmosphere that we have here and if we give strong academics coupled with that I think that you know that's a wow factor in itself so I think that we can take some comfort in that agreed um, it's it's just sometimes hard to get people in the building and that's what I that's what I've seen over the years is you know it, it's just like advertising right like you can cut back your advertising budget but you know you're probably not gonna see growth while you're doing that so so we are trying to we and I want to share out like we are very we're, we're some of the things we're doing we're utilizing resource I want to make that very clear like 
you know, the painting is going to save us thousands and thousands of dollars just by, you know, utilizing resources here. Um, the, you know, I've had a commitment from PTO for certain things um, for phase one and hopefully for a phase two. Um, I've talked to, um, we saw with the football field, you know, the donations that are coming in to get that done. So, so I just want to be clear that we are, we are utilizing every, everything we can to, to build upon that. Um, but again, the vision has been from day one is to have a space. And, and like I look at it this way, you know, if we do all this work and we don't know what will happen with enrollment, right? Like if you would have told me in August we're up 90 kids, I would have jumped up and down in August and said, ah, how we how we get there, right? Well, like I've shared at the, the town or the, cha the chamber address, it's not just one thing. It's a, that's a lot of variables. And so what might work for some families may not matter to others, but it's a combination of all those little things that moves the needle. And so, um, so in the end, if, if the enrollment doesn't go up, I look at it this way, the children of this awesome community are going to have some really cool stuff and they deserve that, right? The, this is a special place. And so, um, the smiles on their face and the fact that they have some special things that other schools don't have, I think is, in the end, I, I, I can feel good about that, that we, we did that for those kids. So, um, so I understand we have a budget. Tyler's very tight on that budget, and that's a good thing. <laughs> but um, I'm hoping that some donations and some other things will come in to get me over the top on some of the things that I want to do. And Mr. Edge, my address too, like in the budget, priority one is to make these schools succeed for both the elementary and middle. So, that, I mean, that's being done, um, and that's being prioritized. Some of these items that you may see ahead of time in the procurement process are items that we know um, that we're going to have budget for. Um, but at the top priority of the, of the project budget for this is to make these schools safe and, and operational. Um, okay. Anything left on that is, is, is uh, going to be you know, the yeah. wow factor. Yeah. So um, we know we set a budget that's fiscally responsible for, for what we have. We've been thankful that the district has been conservative in their capital spending. Um, and so um, you know, we're going to be intentional with how we spend that money. Um, and I know Dr. J. Um, has a lot of wild factor ideas, but I'm keeping them within budget. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I mean, my biggest concern is just that if we start getting into like a competition with wow factor, you know, Scottsdale's huge. Yeah, you're not they, yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah. I think that we need to really focus on what our strengths are, which is that we're kind of in a small community. We get a lot of community support. We have involvement. I think that those are our wow factors. And yeah. not that we shouldn't No, and I, and I wish that did it, but things, we have 357 yeah. kids in Scottsdale. That it didn't do it and that's mm -hmm. uh, you know I, I don't disagree with you but I've been here a long time and you know Haynes mentioned it before we've upped our scores we've upped our salaries you know we we've done a lot of things that we thought would keep kids here and it didn't well and I think and we're so, moving in a good direction with the extracurriculars with clubs I think are. that because that's what but I hear a lot still about something with Scottsdale. Missing, and it's that we've said forever as long before I was on the board that Fountain Hills need an identity. And we don't, and just saying we're a community school doesn't do it. We need an identity. We need something to draw people in. We tried the EVIT thing, that didn't work. You know, that we, you know, when EVIT partnered with us, that it was, oh, we'll get kids from Cave Creek and kids from Scottsdale, and they didn't come. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, now, you know, I think Kane has some good ideas where if you have, you know, that project based learning, like, even though Scottsdale may have some wow factors, they don't have that. They, they don't have these great, you know, the space center and, and um, the, the outdoor learning spaces and things like that, at least not right here. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's important to, to look at how we can make ourselves unique and yeah. what, what's going to bring that. And it's that impression when you do tours, right? Like, I think about, you know, when you go looking at houses, you know, you, you, a lot of times you you have to look past what's there to see the potential. But when we're in such a competitive market here with with, you know, families that are looking at, you know, where am I going to send my kid? You're right. You, you can't have a beautiful building and, and low academics and and bad things happen. And in there it's got to be good. So it's, it's a combination of having all of that. And so we've done a lot of tours this year. And I got to tell you that. There's times where I kind of cringe a little bit about how the walls look or how the building looks. And, and so those are all first impressions to families. And, and 
in our, our immediate, you know, competition, there, not all those buildings are, are, are wonderful and great either, but they're, they, they will be in time. And I just think to keep up and to, uh, to, you know, to build upon, you know, we, if we want to continue to be successful athletically, we need those top athletes coming out of elementary school to stay in middle school and come into high school. Mm -hmm. And so we have to have something at each level. And so what we're really doing is the building and the magic of the classroom teacher is the already, the magic's there. I mean, they're an A-plus school. Um, uh, you know, they, they have done that in the past. Now it's coupling that with the aesthetics and, and the learning experience, the immersive learning the uh, school of discovery and, and that marketing that comes into that. Then at the middle school, it's really about, you know, the academic offerings, the, the honors and gifted program will hopefully keep them in the schools. And then in the high school, I really like what we've done with the schedule. We're, you know, almost done with that. But the offerings and the things that the kids have here, internships, community support, those things, and undefeated basketball team, those things go a long way. But Coach Salzman can speak to this as a longtime wrestling coach. There's there's lean years of kids coming out. Right. Yeah. And and so you want to be competitive in those sports, you gotta keep your kids. And one of the reasons that basketball team has been so successful, and I've seen these kids since preschool, is because they're all still here. Mm -hmm. You know, they and, didn't leave. And our newest school is twenty years old, Dana? Yeah. twenty it was two thousand two for the middle school, right? The middle school, yeah, about that. So that's the newest one. So 20 years, and it hasn't had a lot of upgrades. So a couple layers, layers of paint, that's about it. Mm -hmm. And then when <clears throat> the when Fort Peaks closed, they moved that playground equipment I had showed you guys. Mm -hmm. You know, they moved that. But other than that, not a lot's been done. So, so what is uh, in phase one? Yeah. Uh, phase one is fencing um, at the current issue. current middle school because I, I, I have some issue with the fact that a kid can walk out a door and just keep going. Okay, so we have to fix that. Um, and um, that was not originally, you know, in my budget, but now it is. So I have to, you know, I have to address that. Um, I think that's a bigger issue for the whole district as a future, you know, uh, bond or override issue uh, of fencing across the whole district, which is very expensive. So they're going to design it where it's, it's just on the perimeter to keep somebody from, from coming in. You have to have access for kids to get out. So, you know, you still have that issue, but it's really about people coming into that campus too. Um, so that's one. Uh, playgrounds would be in phase one right now to get that up, uh, get that ordered and um, started. At both uh, the middle school and the elementary school? Uh, just the elementary school. There's one gate at the new middle school between the lecture hall and the music room that needs to be added there. And there needs to be a, a push gate added to the bus lane. Well, there was a fence in the gate between the lecture hall and the, and the music when we opened up the campus. Yeah. Because they're under the same configuration as we were back yeah. in those so, days. Yeah. But you make a good point. In the west side of, of those two middle school buildings, it's one door and you're gone. And even though there's a retaining wall and some other yeah. issues there. So my question is, um, from a fire uh, standpoint, um, where do the kids in that building go for a fire? Well, that's what we need to add, is we need to add those push gates at all yep. those exits. Can so go out, but not in. Okay. Yeah, and, and, it's, and it's hard because, you know, you know, being a principal of a large high school and there's push gates all over, yep. kid wants to leave, they're just walking out the gate, and so that's a hard thing. I get that, but you also can't lock them in because of a fire or an active shooting situation. They have to be able to get off campus. So... That's where the cameras come in down the road, the motion detection and those types of things. So there's a whole, whole you know, um, phased approach to that. But again, um, when you start getting into those types of things, we're, what we're trying to do is say, we can't get everything we need done. We can't get all the roofing, security, all those things done because you know, we don't have that funding that, that we went for in November. But what we are trying to do is to save our one of our precious resources which is our our staff and and it's getting more and more competitive um and what tyler's district pays and what we pay it's not even in the same realm okay and so 
we love that you know our staff is dedicated in there and we have I, I feel really good about the number of contracts that will be signed this 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 year and we've done the little things you know the the acknowledgement support meetings the staff picnic the visibility on their campuses uh, surveying feedback days making them feel that they're welcome and that their their ideas get through to us but at some point that that paycheck comes into play and the only way that we can raise the paycheck is to get more kids in the door so so if we say teacher retention and student retention is important it has to, we have to keep moving this needle the other way and um, like I said, for the first time in a decade, we're actually going the opposite way, and I think we got to ride that momentum as far as we can and keep trying to get them in. So, um, Corporate Winslow is going to be doing the site plan as far as um, the middle school and the fencing. And the so, so where we're at with some of this is um, we've identified some areas where we don't believe we need their assistance. Playgrounds is one, fencing is another. Okay, so those will be coming through to you in one of those, you know, uh, alphabet soup type things that he's been talking about over there. History teacher coming up. So, um, but yes, <laughs> um, but it'll come to you that way. But for maybe the library, if there's construction in there to put in, like one of the things we've talked about is, you know, um, stadium, you know, stadium kind of seating for a, a, a presenter or to read to the children and things like that. Then, then that would be they would design that, and then we would go through the general contractor for that. I'm, I'm really concerned about code uh, when it comes to because we when we built the, this high school, I was on the facility committee then just before I got on board, and even when I got on board a couple of years later, um, that west side was a problem for us from a Standpoint. So I just want to make sure that this time through that we go to the you know, fire chief or uh, absolutely and that's that's you know John with the fencing will include all that to make sure we have the right exit points and the right type of fencing we already know that that's been I've been that was an issue when I years ago too and I've Your classroom was right there yeah, well, when we talked about that just the last few years as principal, we talked about, you know, the bus lane itself needed to be updated. They finally, the last couple of years, we did finally update the gym where you come in for a game. There is that, that push gate out over where the kids go for lunch to the parking lot. There's a push gate out. So some of that's been addressed, but more of it needs to be. So, yes, the, everything we do will go through, you know, the town, the fire, the trust, um, the playground equipment all be approved by the trust for insurance purposes. Um, but but some of these companies can do some of the work that Orcut Winslow would do for us themselves, so we're not going to utilize them for those things. What is our all-in budget that we're talking about for the project? Yeah, so we set $2.5 million um, with about $1.8 million of actual construction costs. Um, that 700000 difference is, is mostly contingencies and basically contingency so we, we want to be conscious that you know, we know that costs increase we want also want to be conscious of, of projects like that that's right we, that needs to take priority um, and that needs to be done first and so um, that's the budget that we've set and uh, we haven't done anything yet but as, as I said you'll start seeing some of that and so I'll make sure on the on those agenda items that you see the budget that we're starting at maybe previous costs and then costs being proposed and so you guys can track that as we work through this consolidation process, because it's going to be, again, multiple meetings where you see different things come through, just from timelines and, and to try to get ahead of things. But um, we'll be transparent in that process, and we can have that total budget, and so we can start to basically do a little ledger in some of those board ad, board items. So, and the priority. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay, the priority we in our last consolidation meeting we talked about. You know, the priority right now is to get the middle school, the new middle school, uh, West Wing, um, completely done. And because that comes out of the total budget for the other site, right? The other site, you could probably move the kids over, you know, if you had to tomorrow and they'd be just fine to go to class. There would be some things that are awkward. There'd be some things that you have to repair and fix. But the building itself, you know, you're pretty much ready to go without doing some of the other things that we're trying to do. 
Um, so we have some bathroom repairs at the in the west wing. We have um, some flooring polishing to do. We have the painting, which is getting done outside, mostly outside that budget. Uh, and then we have um, the tech we've already purchased. So for those rooms, so it's just installing them, which is a summer project, not too difficult. So once John has all of those purchase orders, which him and Tyler worked on today of a deadline and getting those in, then that work will start progressing. We'll know what that costs. That'll come off that, that 1.8 million. And then what's left, we'll go over to the other site to start doing the work over there that needs to be done. Where's McDowell Mountain in this? McDowell Mountain is really, you know, the, the real request there is we have to update the playground over there. We think we have some additional um, other funding outside of what, you know, capital that we might be able to use. We're looking into that um, to get that playground done. And that will also be a phased approach. We can't do everything we want to do at the preschool over there in one year. So it'll be to get a playground in that's age appropriate. And outside of that, there's mesh screening that needs to go on the, the fencing. Those are probably your two biggest ticket items. It really doesn't have to have a playground to start because they have two uh, licensed playgrounds already. Um, they're not ideal place for the kids when they get dropped off. It doesn't flow well. Um, and then the idea of, of having a new lobby, but that would be, again, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a necessity. It's, it's a want, and if we can make it work, we are. But they have a lobby, obviously, with the front entry of McDowell Mountain already. It's not the best, but it, it does work if we, if we run out of funding. And, the, and keeping the kids from going down the halls to the west, east, uh, you're going to have to have some kind of barrier there? There's doors already there. Yeah. And they're going to stay there. And they yeah. lock. Yeah, yeah. So. <clears throat> How will those, if we're using the McDowell Main Lobby, and we're locking those doors how does that it would have to be the the support staff that's there would have to walk kids down which they would do anyway um and we just have to get into a rhythm of how it works like i said it's not ideal the ideal is to make the music room a lobby um we think we could put a door in there pretty pretty inexpensive and uh even have a, a nursing station in there with a bathroom but again what I think is not a big deal turns into a huge cost, and we have to look at all that. So, um, but I, 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 I think there's a lot of, you know, there's going to be some, not everything's going to be perfect in year one. It's just not. It's going to take a couple of years because of where we're at. But I can share again and again and again, the current model is not, it's not working. And that's why we're where we're at. It has to change. And so there's going to be some, there's going to be some, you know, I, I, I've seen a school be built and kids have PE in a, in a hallway for a year while it's being built. It's, it's rough. We're not doing anything that extreme. Our kids will have a great experience. And most of the work at the elementary school, like I said, is in non-academic, you know, classroom areas. So it's really about having a beautiful library to teach kids the love of reading and to be excited about going there and to be a reward and really sell the school when we do tours because that's the centerpiece of that school. Um, I'm, I'm really pushing hard on play. I, I think after the pandemic, kids don't play a lot. They didn't prior to and they certainly don't now. And we need to we need to emphasize play in the class in, in school. And so having a, options and playgrounds and, and different activities for them to do promotes what we're trying to accomplish with communication skills and being collaborative and, and all the things that children need growing up. And so we really need to emphasize play. And there's a lot of studies out there that show that the more the kids play, the more the more love they have of coming to school and being successful. Successful. So, yeah. I want to thank Tyler and, and you for working with him because $700,000 contingency on a day, on just on a yearly situation is barely we're discussing and air conditioning you know goes the children has a problem you know um, we don't really have uh, enough money to cover any of those hopefully insurance or whatever we can pull off well we have other air contingency air funds this is just the i know that, i know okay. that but, but they can go fast yeah, yeah it's not ideal but unfortunately this is you know what i feel comfortable you know Proposing the cane um, in terms of the budget that you have available, and you know what happened, it. you know, in the November election. So this is what you have, and the reality of what you have. So couldn't agree more. Thank you.
Thank you. Yep. Um, so a couple, Kane mentioned a couple of things are time sensitive. And so um, while we're talking about finance, we need to have an, um, a meeting next week because there are some th things that are time sensitive. One being that um, Kane and Krista and our staff found a grant to help um, replace the small gym at the high school to replace the flooring because it's so bad there. But unfortunately, it has to be turned in by March 31st. So um, it's a grant with the Arizona Sports and Tourism Authority. And uh, the flooring cost would be almost 130000 And if we are approved for the grant, it, they would pay 66.6% .6 of it. So that would only leave us about 43000 And they would pay 86000 But like I said, it has to be approved by March 31st. And then also the playgrounds um, need to be in that same meeting and we need to start getting moved forward because of the, the time constraints. So um, next week, if there's a, meet, a day that works best for everyone, like at five o'clock that we can meet, um, or if anybody has a conflict, please speak up now because we'll need to schedule that meeting. Wednesday's the only day. You can be here Wednesday? Wednesday the 29th? Does that work for everybody? I'll have to work out baseball practice, but it's okay. I do that tonight anyway. <laughs> it's only going to be like 20 minutes. Okay. No so worries. it's going to be a short, short meeting. So, um, but yeah, we have can, to. Can we have it a little later? She has baseball practice. Oh, I, I have five to six and six to seven, so oh, we're good. Okay, sorry, I'll, have that, okay. I'll have to work it out either way. We can have we're it good. earlier. <laughs> um, yeah, we have to, in order to apply for the grant, they need a, um, a letter up, uh, from the board. Uh, sure. A commitment to complete letter that if they approve it that we're going to move forward with it so it does need board approval so uh, if March 29th works for everyone at 5 o'clock we will have a very short business meeting to um, work on the the grant and the playgrounds what are you gonna replace the floor with uh, a wood floor like a varsity gym like we did when we first opened it. yeah the idea is all middle school games would be there we'd center the floor and um, all, that would be the middle school's uh, gym for sports and for PE. And that rubber floor has been there since, I would say, nine, probably, nine, probably 2000, 2001. When, when, the other, when the wood floor um, got wet and buckled, it was this high. Yeah. We replaced it with, with uh, tile, basically. Oh, LPG. Yeah. 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 And then the tile was... They put the rolled on rubber over the, over tile. the tile. Yeah. So it, it for, for being a full time school now, and also yeah. uh, we'll add some bleachers to it for, for the, the middle school games, which are not as highly attended as high school. We're, you know, back to the future. That, that's exactly the structure <laughs> that we had when yes. we opened It's all coming back around. <laughs> all right. So Wednesday, uh, March 29th at 5 o'clock, please plan on being here. All right. Can I ask one other question? Kind yeah. of about um, the phase project in, in the beginning, you felt that we probably we had enough to manage the wow factor that you mm -hmm. had imagined. Now we're adding fencing kind of into that. What other expenditure are we taking away from that wow factor that you um, had envisioned? I, I think it's just that when we first walked with Orcutt Winslow, you know, nothing I talked about, I think the phrase they use, nothing, none of this is scaring us. Mm -hmm. But now they're scared. And so <laughs> that, that, that was disappointing to me. Like, just the fact that, I think it's just that when you think about all the things and, and then you see the space and that each team room is 3,600 square feet, the library's mm -hmm. 3,900 square feet, the playground is 15,000 square feet, you look at that and, and it's just a lot of, you know, $175 a square foot, it adds up fast. And so I don't want to, I don't want to have things that I don't want to, we have to get everything working. And that's what the, pro, that's the first thing is the middle school. We've already said, you know, outdoor learning space, the middle school has got to be a year two or year three thing. Um, it's just, you know, $2.5 million goes fast. Mm -hmm. And so, um, what I think we're going to do is get a couple of spaces really, really right and really well done. And then the other ones we may have to do at a later time. I also um, feel like it is a little of a blessing in disguise because um, I've always been worried since the moment I came on with consolidation about 
if we do all three team rooms, my concern is if kindergarten does have the, the growth that we're hoping to have, we're gonna run out of space fast there. And so um, right now I've kind of come to the realization that the kindergarten wing is probably gonna be left alone, maybe some furniture put in and maybe some, some, maybe some screens on the wall that are touch screen or something like that for, for co collaborative group work and things like that. But we may have to divide that team room into four classrooms if, if this works and growth happens. Um, I feel comfortable with doing that. We can get to 175 in kindergarten, 175 in first grade. If that happens, we're celebrating at a big, big level. But I think for the future proofing of things, I, I feel more comfortable knowing that we have that space. Um, I've talked to school facility board. They said if you know your enrollment explodes, um, that they would just add a building probably onto the middle school campus, the new, new in McDowell Mountain. And I think we have the land to do that. And I think they could grant us the land as well if they needed to. Um, and that might be another wing that ends up being like, you know, fourth and fifth grade wing that, for the older kids, you know, an intermediate move to a different building to move on to middle school. I mean, there's a lot of vision there, but it just goes fast. Starting to get along in the process, where we're putting pen to paper, um, but the next step is kind of getting you know, some of these quotes in place with, with contractors. Contractors committed, so we can lock in some of this pricing because you you blink and it changes. Change. Oh, yeah. um, yeah. And that's another thing we didn't factor when we started in August. Pricing has obviously gone up a lot, mm -hmm. and that changes things. So, yeah. So. Um, I think whatever we get done will we'll accomplish the goal of the wow. Um, no one has the full wow of what I have in my mind because I can't share it. Nobody has the money. Right, right. <laughs> so, so Just it so should, you're clear about that. So right it, shouldn't be it shouldn't be disappointing to anybody yeah. because they don't know. Like To me, it might be. I might walk and go, eh, it's not what I want. But we'll get there. And that's the thing. You know, I, I just believe like you, you, you you plan for what you want. Maybe you do the flooring and the wall art in year one, and then you add some of those other things in year two, and you just keep building upon it. So, you know, in a couple of years, you're walking that campus going, this place is beautiful, right? And so, and hopefully more kids will come in and we're, we're being smart with spending our money that, you know, we can add one or two items a year over the next couple of years. Just a real quick question or statement. We're up, say, 86 students. But we don't have that money, right? No. Because the money only gets allocated as of the numbers in October. So for next year, Jan we'll have that. Days. We did get some days. of it. About, we got 300,000. January, 300, January, January is 100 days. Okay. Yeah, 100 days. Any, any okay. students after that 100 day, yeah, the district is not, um, cannot revise up to that right. budget number because you're, you're based your budget on the 100 day enrollment. Mm -hmm. so. and, right. and that's why when we did our meet and confer process, we were a little conservative on that. Mm -hmm because Tyler and Alicia want to see if that number sticks in the next year yeah. and if it's sustainable. And if, it, if, if, we, if we're at that level come August and September and we get more kids coming in, then, then we can then free up some more, some more of that money to salaries right. in year two. Yeah. Yeah. Are there other questions regarding the procurement or the consolidation? Okay. We'll move on to the next part of the finance discussion, uh, which are like the financials and uh, the board reports and things like that. The point of the discussion is to figure out as new board members what you're looking for in the financials so that we can start mitigating some of the FOIAs and the direct requests um, that are coming through just because it's overtaxing our staff. And with the amount of information that's being requested, um, we don't want to have to hire somebody that, that just fulfills the board's requests and things like that. So if we can figure out like what we're looking for as a board financially um, with the financial documents, that would be helpful. It, it's also really important that um, when someone requests something, you know, I'll just use you as an example, Libby, I'm sure. not pointing you out, but Go like when you requested the Four Peaks yes. Providence, loss, that when you do that, if you'll request that it gets sent to the whole board, that way the whole board has all yeah. of the information and it's not just one board member who has a piece of information and then a, another board member is requesting a different piece of information, but they probably go together. That that way the whole board has, it's consistent and it's streamlined. So that's what we're trying to do. So that being said, I requested it through the proper channel. I went to Krista. Mm -hmm. So then can we just ask Krista if that type of situation arise that she then 
it's really direction. Just like when I said to Kane, can you have Krista send the board mm -hmm. the facility use agreement? So in your like when you request it from Krista, if you could just say and please send to the whole board. That way she knows that it's really meant for the whole board. Okay. So. It's just direction. Mm -hmm. okay. So when we request it, do because when I've requested information, I still do a FOIA instead of just requesting it as a board member. On do I just send an email saying, "Hey, I think the board would benefit from seeing this," and I don't need to do a FOIA, or should I still do my so FOIAs? FOIAs? So FOIAs are are meant. It, it, the Freedom of Information Act is really meant for the community. Mm -hmm. As a board member, you certainly are entitled to information. Um, each time that a FOIA comes in, we, we have conversations with our attorney. So it's been upping our attorney costs that literally every time we have, almost every time we have a FOIA, that we run it by the attorney. So, it, you know, and that's what we're trying to mitigate here, that we want to figure out, like, what information is Lillian asking and you're asking and Libby's asking, that is it something that can just come on a regular report so that we don't have so many direct requests for information or so many FOIAs coming through. And, and really, as board members, you shouldn't have to put in a FOIA. I mean, you're, you know, that's the okay. point. But mm -hmm. I had asked specifically for information on our contract for our field in an email. Mm -hmm. I was responded to saying I needed to submit a FOIA. Okay. I find that offensive as a board member sure. that that was what was stated when it's something we're talking about. Sure. Um, and that's the only reason then I assumed that, okay, then I need to submit right. the public records request for the next documentation. No, you, you shouldn't have to. Um, I, I think there was just a lot with the football field that there were a lot of different pieces to the puzzle and nothing came together up in the right way. So I'm not making excuses. I just think that it's just like I said when I was on the dais that I've been through six superintendents and four finance directors since we approved that field. And really, it, in the time of us discussing the field, it never dawned on me that people didn't have what I had. It, it just never dawned on me. And so it wasn't until Kane and I were having a conversation and I was like, what do you mean? And here, here's, you know, here's the presentation from core construction. You know, here's here's the information that was in the minutes. It, it just never, the 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 puzzle pieces weren't coming together. So I, you know, the football field probably got handled, you know, a little differently than than regular finance. And I know Tyler and Alicia are cleaning up a lot of the finance, and so that's also part of the the issue right now is that, um, you know, after four finance directors. Yeah, things, you know, and especially over the past couple years with COVID and different people coming in, things are a little screwed up right now. And so Tyler's been working really hard with Alicia to fix that. Um, and that's why we're not actually having like, you know, hey, Tyler, what about this report? And what about this report? That's why we're not having that conversation tonight because he's still cleaning things up. But as a board, we just want to make sure that one, we're all receiving the same information. Two, that if there's things that Dana and I are familiar with that we're not questioning, but the three of you are questioning, let's figure out how to get that so that our staff aren't, you know, given requests, you know, here, here's one from Libby, here's one from Madison, oh, now there's one from Lillian, and oh, now back to Madison, that on a weekly basis that it's tying our staff up too much and there's too, there's too little of them to handle so many requests. So if we can figure out what we're looking for, what you all are looking for, that we can say, look, on this report, core, I use core construction all the time because I just, they're like right in my head. So I don't have any affiliation with core construction. <laughs> Let me just be really clear about that. I don't know them. I'm not in charge of them. I know nothing. But I use them a lot because I know that like they did the field and stuff. But if there's something that says core construction 25,000, just for example, is there a way that it's helpful that says core construction 25,000 middle school HVAC? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's what I, that's what I'm trying to have this discussion tonight to help us be more in tune with each other and to help our staff give us what we want without being asked for this request and this request and this request and giving them time to do their jobs. So that's what that's what I need from you guys. <laughs> well, and, and Tyler's and I'm speak for you, but he's available to meet with the board as needed to to answer questions mm -hmm. that you have, and that's what we want to we want to get to is is just that unity of 
let's let's you know get the questions that we need answered collectively as a group and then as that and then we can work more efficiently to get things done for the district that need to get done yeah, yeah. so I had reached out to King with some questions I had about the budgets mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. proposed and adopted and tying to our monthly financial statements. You requested I email Alicia. Mm -hmm. I did on February 20th. Mm -hmm. I have not received a response. I followed up with you on March 6th. Mm -hmm. I have not received a response. Mm -hmm. So I would appreciate, you know, Tyler was asking me a little bit about it before the meeting, that I would appreciate kind of sitting down. I've sought out a ton of training mm -hmm. to understand a lot of it um, to have some of those basic budgetary questions answered yeah. okay and you know sitting here in this public meeting you're, you're sharing that our finances are a mess right but then in the same token you're asking us to trust the process no I'm not asking you to trust the process I'm asking what information would make the process easier to understand I'm not asking you to trust the process because I know there's a lot of questions. Yeah, well, I've asked for purchase orders and for supporting documents. I think that anytime we have especially big expenses or, you know, finalizing the warranty, things like that, to me, we would need supporting documents always. Mm -hmm. And, we, you know, it's been said that Kelly kind of got us into some contracts that weren't good. You know, were those contracts in the board packet to review? You know, we have a lot of expenses that I think just need another set of eyes if purchase right. orders have to be submitted anyway that's just another page in the package. well anything over 10 you're going to get three bids you're going to see that and and those don't actually come for approval remember anything over a hundred thousand comes right. for mm -hmm. approval so so i i understand that and when when we say a mess i want to be clear yeah. on that that yeah. that means that there is some reconciliation that needs to take place but they have Tyler has looked through the, the books and he's looked at a, a lot of things for us. And, 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 you know, there's the, the money is there. And obviously that's why we're, yeah, we're there's no fraud. Like there's, right. there's no misuse of public funds. There's no fraud. I want to be very clear about that. There, there's no mismanagement of funds. Yes. It's yeah. just different there, coding. Been, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of turnover. Um, people have done processes in different ways. And so, um, we're just reconciling all that to make sure one, um, we meet our audit obligation, which we just finalized for last year. And you'll see a lot of these um, notations, which are um, basically just managing funds, timely reconciliations, timely deposits. So um, when you say mess, everything's still there. But there's no misuse of public, there's no fraud. Um, it's just we have some processes that we have to work through. And with the department being new um, and being turned over, that takes a little time. Um, we're also still trying to keep the district moving forward. Um, and that takes time too. So when we get these requests, as we're cleaning up and still trying to move things forward, it, it is very timely um, on the staff. And I don't want to be, we're not trying to hide anything. We're not trying to be um, not transparent in this process, um, but it would be helpful, yeah, if we had a time to meet to discuss them because questioning on email would often lead to more questions and we can continue that process. Um, but taking some time to, to talk through a budget um, show you the adopted budget, show how the district utilizes it versus what you're pulling offline without any context. There may be some, some differences, and I can be able to, to help you understand that and how the district utilizes that and how there may be variances between the adopted budget and the monthly financials. Um, and so we're trying to build that, obviously, that trust with everybody with this new, our, our new administration with, you know, the trainings, the opportunities we've had to look at financials. Um, you know, bringing every every purchase that's a major purchase, you know, to to the board. Even some of them weren't even required. It was just transparency purposes. This is where we're, what we're spending our money on, or this is a, a group we're bringing in, things of that nature. So, um, I, I think if I think we start with the meetings, I think it would be a really good way to get going. And then you can ask those questions on those financials. You can have the computer out. He can look at that. We can research it, and we can go from there. But. Um, like I said, this year, the, there hasn't been a lot of purchases in capital at all, unless they were related to the, really to the consolidation. Um, a few software purchases were under 10,000 just for us to be able to do our job at the level we want to do it at. We've been really, really um, conservative with our spending this year. And so, um, we're not going to be in a month from now because of the consolidation, but 
but the, the idea is we I don't believe in wasting any money on anything unless it's going to bring something of value to our children and to our community yeah so we just need to we just need to have those conversations so you feel comfortable that's mm -hmm. where we right. need to get so Tyler if we scheduled a training with you again um, where we can sit down and you can go over things like that is it a one-hour training two-hour training I always start one hour or one and a half um, okay. I do want to be respectful of everybody's time, but yep. also allow enough time to, to have those conversations and to dig into some of those. So, well, uh, and that, is this going to be like a recurring thing? Because there, I mean, I feel so, like it would either need to be recurring or we'd need to have the supporting documents just so that, you know, and it's not a lack of trust because I think that you've done a lot of good work here. Mm -hmm. But, the, you know, the comment has been made that Kelly spent her money on lots of different things. And again, you know, where was it in front of the board that it didn't get? caught at some point that maybe some of these extend expenses aren't well it's not the best. that yeah and and it's not that it didn't come before the board but when you have a superintendent who tell you know who sold it to the board the board approves it yeah well so, that's why i'm saying you trust but you verify and you make sure that you're looking at the things and saying okay i don't like this contract or i don't like this expense or you know i have concerns here which is why i would like to see yeah. things like purchase orders we can do we can, so right. another, but we can again do it only comes to the board when it's a certain dollar amount yeah and well, so the board's not that but that's state statute that's state. Yeah. so well that's, we can do more strict we can't we can, do less but so. you also have you know we're also not in charge of daily operations so you have to find that that balance mm -hmm. Of but again, we keep blaming Kelly for getting us into this situation, and well, that's easy when what she's Kelly gone. Got into the situation. No, so but, well, I mean, just to bring it back, here here's the thing: every time we have, you know, we we any question about financials, I always call and ask ahead of time. Is there anything? So we've been doing that every month or twice a month, so that mm -hmm. you when you have a question, what is this company like? What's educational? Yeah, and networks? I'm sure you love my fifty I do, questions I every do. time. I do. I really do because it's 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 helping you to understand. That there are expenses that maybe we don't want, but we mm -hmm. have to have. Like, I don't have someone to run the website. I've, you know, we don't have someone to make sure it's ADA compliant, that it has all those factors into it. Because there's, if you ever spend some time in the district office, it is very quiet because there's nobody there. We're all at meetings. We're all there's only three of us, really four of us on that side of the the area. So, so we we don't have the capacity to do certain things, and we have to. We have to use outside companies or consultants or things for those 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 items. I think the combination of Tyler making himself available to answer those questions and then you having the financials every time we have a board meeting and me answering those questions about what is this. You know, there was one the other day about this uh, shade structures. Well, we after looking into it, you know, it was um, it was the softball field, right? And that's something we need for our, for our parents and our kids that come to games. So everything that is being spent should have a purpose. I think where it gets hard to understand is all the maintenance costs mm -hmm. because the buildings are so old and there's so many things that fail and go wrong. And the idea is to get these things replaced over time so that we're not spending our, our M&O money on these types of, of repairs over and over and over again. And so part of that is going through the school facility board and part of that is, is if this board wants to go out again for a bond or override in November. Yeah. Just another back to the future. Yeah. <laughs> 27 years ago when I got on board, I had a desk next to the bookkeepers. And, and before me, there was another board member that occupied that desk. We went through every invoice, every person sort of, that was how stupid I was back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> if there was any... Are you calling us stupid? No, I, <laughs> what you're doing is nothing compared to what we did. Trust me. The problem fun. is there's no more paper. Uh, well, so, it's true. <laughs> yeah, so true. now, now but, you have to have an access code to be able to see anything. Well, we all have we have that ability. But my point is, uh, I learned school finance in that first year, um, and you know, the current mayor was on the board, so that's why I'm not allowed in town hall anymore. And we go back 25, 30 <laughs> years. But uh, it was a great opportunity. Now, I think I don't want to. You know, I'm guilty as heck. Thought of that either, but we got through it, and uh, there were some issues back in those days with our superintendents and, and other people. But um, we all learned because every time that I finished, you know, I was I, I spent two hours at a board meeting explaining what I saw in the last week because that, that's me, you know, that was my background. But 
sharing that with the board and, and the administration um, was a long process, took way too much time, but we had a very knowledgeable board uh, and community because we packed that in the Boys and Girls Club is where we were at at the time. Uh, and so if I have a suggestion, it's, you know, spend time. Uh, you know, the books are open to you. You can look at every invoice. You can look at every check that was ever written. Um, any, it's all available to the board member. There's, you don't need a FOIA request. You can walk in the door and say, can I sit down and look at the checkbook for the last month? That's your ability. Take advantage of it. But I don't think, I don't believe that's being offered to this <coughs> Yeah, board. it doesn't have to be offered. You have the ability to do that. Yeah, and that's why I think we're asking questions, but then we're being sent emails telling us to well, that shouldn't be stay the case. in our lane. Uh, well, and that, your lane is, is to over, yeah, yeah, among other things. Correct. But that is one of our duties. Based so, on uh, you know, you don't want to do the job of our controller, but you want to make sure you understand uh, school finance, first of all. Right. Um, and work with staff yep. and not um, you know, thinking that there's some kind of conflict between staff and the board because that doesn't work. Right. I, I don't think we have that. Another I've, way I've, of I've, I've seen phrasing it. it. I've seen it in, in all levels of, of education in Arizona. When I was on the governing board for the, you know, we, we spent a billion and a half dollars a year. Um, and I didn't sit in their office. Um, yeah. But I did, uh, I'm, I'm just talking, I'm a geek when it comes to accounting. So I, I, I just think, you know, work together. Um, if, if, because there's a lot of confusion when you start asking questions, because you can assume different things Unless you're an accountant, unless you're Tyler, um, you really haven't been with your nose in it uh, every day. You need to get there. I've and, worked and in that takes time. For, I know you have. So Don't be wrong. For me to have questions and then not be able to answer them and be requested to sit in the board meeting and approve these. Yeah. We got to get better. Agenda. Yeah. Yes, I. I and I don't I'm care that I'm asking it's them, accusing new. them of not doing their jobs appropriately, but just having a better understanding. It's nothing new. You know, 27 years of this right. it happens all the time. And so it's just a matter of staff working with the board members with their expertise in different areas um, to, to, to work it through because, you know, we do represent the community um, and, um, and they, they uh, do a great job. Let's face it. We're, I was taken by surprise, as Jill knows, when I first got on this board again what was going on. Um, it wasn't until I really figured that out and I got my emails opened up <laughs> that we knew we had to make a change. And so that's been a rough you know, year and fortunately we had somebody that we could bring in to, to keep the doors open and, and now more uh, mm -hmm. that he's done. I would have never thought 80 students. That's great. Positive. I would have think you know, 30 or 40 lower every year. And we still got to deal with we're graduating 120 and we're bringing in 50. That's an issue. No, Kane's going to bring in more. So yeah. well, well, let's <laughs> let's start with Tyler. Well, and all, all we're at looking for is just a little patience, right? Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I'm helping the district out on my free time. I have a full time day job. Um, I, I love this. I told Kane, you know, I'm here. I'm going to give you as much as I can. Um, but you know, Alicia's brand new to school finance. Uh, mm -hmm. She does have the payroll side. Um, she's very knowledgeable in that. But to to put her in that position is not fair to her as she's learning this process as well mm -hmm. as the other staff in the department um, who, who don't have that, that knowledge. But um, it, it, it's all open book. Um, there's nothing we're hiding. Um, the difference you, what Dana said about going and sitting in is there's no paper anymore. Yeah, so all, now you have to have credentials to be able to log in mm -hmm. and see you know, what Alicia would, sees and stuff Which is like that. why it would be nice to maybe have it in our packet so that I don't have to ask all the questions. and. Another way of looking at it is just letting us help you look at it, you know, because you are one person and there's not a lot of people in the district office. It's just another set of eyes. So let's start what, with Tyler yeah. and, and schedule an hour and a half mm -hmm. session with him. Um, and then we can go over the budget items that you were talking about. I still would like to look at the the vouchers. Um, you know, like I said, if it says core construction, 25,000, if there's a way to add a field to that, Tyler, that gives a little bit more information about what's being paid, because I know that's a lot of Madison's questions, is when you start vouchers, seeing yeah. 
yeah, when you start seeing these high dollars, it's like, well, what are we paying? And why do we keep paying them yeah, every like month? Like, what is it? And it has the same company or like five different companies dealing with air conditioning. You know, what, what site is it going to? What right. are they working so on? So if what there's like another what field what that we can from. add to, to give just at least, a, a, you know, some sort of like subfield of we paid this and it, this is what it was designated to, um, you know, just because, you know, we do have three new people that haven't been in the district, and so they're not familiar with companies that we pay, you know, constantly. And um, and even for Dana and I, like, every once in a while a new one pops up, and, and unfortunately that's how I found procurement issues a couple years ago. So, it, you know, it just... Yeah, we can, we can just definitely look to add yeah. and modify mm -hmm. that, that voucher report to include um, some additional information to help mm -hmm. um, and do, answer mm -hmm. some more questions or make it a little more clear what was expended. Yeah. Do evenings work better for you or daytime? Um, probably evenings. Okay. But I, I can make days available. Okay. Um, well, why don't you give Krista a couple options, and then she can send it out to the board, and we'll kind of come together on a date to that we can meet with you. Yeah, that sounds good. So, because yeah, during a regular board meeting, it's hard to like go through all of this. So let's yeah. let's schedule a training with Tyler. Mm -hmm. I, I will note too that as we get into the budget cycle, right, we, we've talked about the tentative budget, and I, I, I stated that that's really um, kind of a process to make the board feel a little more comfortable about what we're estimating, bringing to the board in the actual budget forms. So as, in May, we will have um, a, you know, a full study session regarding the revised budget, and that's going to be revising the current year budget mm -hmm. um, to the actual 100 day numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and so, again, as you start to see some of this stuff come through, um, and understand the, the, the budget cycle. Yeah. Um, I think a lot will, will come clear. And yeah, we'll get, place. yeah, you guys will kind of mm -hmm. connect the dots. Um, and we don't know when we're going to get the base support level numbers. Uh, no, legislature still hasn't approved a K-12 budget, so it doesn't look like it's going to be a chance soon. So. Okay. So Krista, please get with Tyler and and get a couple dates that you can send to the board, and then we'll figure out a, a time that works for everyone. Can I just add that it's 6:45, and we do have on our agenda five to seven. So I don't know how, if you want to go past seven or. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think we need to get through some of this okay. stuff. So, mm -hmm. unless anybody has um, time constraint. I worked out childcare for until eight. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, next up is code of conduct. Um, that uh, is a work in progress. So um, Mr. Alexander uh, has been working on this. Uh, it's not complete, but I did ask him to kind of send what he had been working on and you know, at least give the board a, an idea, but be gentle because it's not complete. It's something to work in progress. And, and so. let me, and I just want to share that my understanding was when I came in is that the current code of conduct was not utilized in the last year or two. And so because that is a board approved code of conduct, we have utilized that for this year. Um, we felt that there's a need to improve upon that. And we started this process probably in August or September, at least the first conversation of doing that. So what he has done so far is comp he's put a compilation together of different things that probably need to be addressed to be more thorough. It's not in its final, you know, um, uh, I guess, um, format. And there are things in there that we obviously need to address. We've been doing that in principal meetings and looking at um, of different things. But I just want to emphasize that when you are at the site level, and you are having to deal with a, a student discipline issue, when you don't have a clear code of conduct, it opens up for a lot of problems and a lot of issues. And coming from that world for many years, whenever we had something that was a violation and, and you know maybe a parent doesn't agree with the outcome of it, when the code of conduct says it's there, it gives the principals some backing, something that they can fall back on and say, I have followed the code of conduct and therefore this is the outcome. And um, Thanks, and, and it's not, you know, uh, a lot of times it's not appealable because it has met the code of conduct that the board has agreed upon that this is it. 
and so i just want to be clear on that moving forward as we go through this discussion that our principals need to have really i think defined areas of what they can and can't do with discipline but at the same time some flexibility within those areas because a key word like a fight could mean two totally different things it could be an argument at an elementary school versus a really bad situation at say a high school so what chris has done is he's put it into grade levels with the new alignment of k5 6 8 9 12 and then also hit on some areas that are missing for example one i loved in a previous position was um, other violation that doesn't fit into the code of conduct but allows the principal the site to take action on a violation that maybe doesn't fit in there but they believe and we we um, we trust in our principals to make those decisions that this is something that needs to be addressed and I've utilized that in the past and it's very very beneficial when something pops up that you've never had to deal with in the past so I just want to preface it with that and, and my question was with this was did we not have a code of conduct or did we change it because you know if there was a code of conduct already why are we going through it all over again well, so we it's do good it's to just know that. it's just very very short and that's why i'm glad to know yeah. that. it's updated um yeah. and again i believe in your packet you have what we currently are utilizing <laughs> yeah, it's like three can see you can see the, the, the heft of that one versus right. what the draft right. looks like and so as mm -hmm. kane said this has mm -hmm. been um something that he and i have talked about ever since the board you you've all established your goals for the for the year then that trickles down to him it trickles down to me and then our principals and so one of my goals was trying to assist with one of his and yours which was policy and procedure um, and there's a lot of areas with that it's not just code of conduct there's some other areas that we're working on as well um, but this has been um, I wouldn't say a labor of love necessarily but <laughs> um, looking at uh, various districts that neighbor us um, and their codes of conduct and making sure that we're not really missing things and so um, the last step before we wanted to present to you is um, things that are written in here like state statute our policies and they're aligned and, and they are and there are some policies that we're not ready to ask but you know maybe to review and discuss that we might want to revisit because they they may be a little outdated or some of the language needs to change um, but you know right now I think we feel comfortable obviously bringing this to you for discussion um, and like Kane said, this is this is a rough draft. You know, we're not um, married to anything right now. Um, you know, we've we've done our due diligence to share this with um, our building leaders, district leader leadership, um, where we've had I think three reads of this to to look it over um, before bringing this to you tonight. Um, and so, um, yeah. And, and regardless of outcome, when this is a final product, it will go to Dave Paoli for review and to make sure that. Correct. there's nothing that we missed and that it's you know legally correct and everything and there's good so and that may take him a little time to get through but mm -hmm. but we want to make sure he's taking a look at it too and, and as kane mentioned as a former building principal and assistant principal overseeing discipline it is very good for them to have a very sound code of conduct that is very clear and concise um, but then on the other side, it's also a really good thing for parents and students too, um, mm -hmm. because they can see this and say, hey, if I step out of line for this infraction, this is what could happen to me. Um, and if you also notice too, there's things in here about parental rights, student rights, um, what they're able to do you know, when it comes to various items um, that may come up um, throughout a particular school year. Um, and so again, it's just, I think trying to be as transparent as possible as far as what our expectations are when a student enters into our halls when a parent elects to enroll their child into our schools so they know this is this is this is what we're asking this is the standard that we hold you to will this be um, well, not that you have that many booklets these days but will this be a booklet that you give i know um where i taught it was in the front of the booklet there was a calendar that the students especially at the high school could have so then the pages that the parents had to sign the student had to sign could be torn off and turned in so if you it's pages pages um four and five of the document are 
the student release forms. And so I'm working uh, with Angie Brooks, um, who oversees all of our power school stuff, um, and having her look at this to make sure that are these questions that parents uh, are addressed once they register or enroll um, so we can digitize this. Um, the very last one on page five, it says code of conduct hard copy request. And so this would be made available not only on the district website, but also each school website. But if a parent wants one, they can simply check this. Yes, I want a hard copy. And those would be available at each school site as well as the district office. And so, I think we would print some that we'd have available, you know, at the district and at the sites if a yes. parent walked in and said, I really want to see this or in a tough conversation with a parent about, you know, when they come to realize that maybe their student has has a code of conduct issue. We give them a copy so they have it for the future. So we do plan to buy some of those, but not, you know, I don't think we want to expend. Yeah, because it's a huge students. expense. Yes. And now when they, they to the computer, so it's not. Yeah, and when they enroll, they do have to acknowledge that they've read or yeah, that's understand it. So, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. so the days of ripping it out and collecting, it's hard to do that, you know, to get mm -hmm. every, every student one in and every right. parent one in. So... It would just be part of the registration and Falcon Fest days that kids would, you know, understand. I've, I, you know, part of that process of, of that registration day is that I, I, I received a copy or I know where to get a copy of the code of conduct. I understand it exists and right. how to access it, and I can get a printed copy if I'd like. Yeah. Do they receive a copy like emailed to them automatically when they enroll, like to the parents, or mm -hmm. is it just something that they click a, a, a box? So, I would like to get back to. You know the planner. I, I think there is some some school planners. I, I guess I'm a little. <laughs> I'm, I'm like you. Like I have some favorable memories of yeah. the old planner. And, oh yeah, I love the planner. You know, bring yes. it up to sign for a pass and things like mm -hmm. that. So, to to order, you know, 1,250 of those through one of our, you know, we a lot of times we use Kyrene School District as a place to get our, our products from. I don't think that's a huge cost on the district to give everyone a copy, but for every parent, yeah, I think they they have access to it a, a digitally. Yeah, we went, uh, you know, Evitt's in a situation where we have 11 of these that send kids to our school. Yes. <laughs> and so the one rule at this school is different than ours and different from that one over there. So Evitt spent a lot of t time putting together their current code of conduct. And I, I think it's probably in the 30 years I've been in this, one of the best. Uh, is it perfect with every 11 districts? Very close, actually. Yeah. Um, ours was kind of left off, to be honest with you, because uh, most of them are 12, 13 pages long. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and now, uh, we used to have to take the back page off and send it home with the kids, and they had to bring it in, and we had to put it in this folder. And right. Now it's part of the registration process, yeah. which is, I think, where you're going. So good. Yeah. Yeah. And we were, we're going to have to add one on there for next year, um, virtual reality permission yeah. slip for mm -hmm. middle school and high school kids only. Um, I'd rather just have a parent sign off that they're good with that, and then the few that say no, we, we identify them, and yep. they can't participate in those activities, do something different. But we can get a lot of those permission forms done in that first registration process. Just like an IEP and a 504, yeah, we right. have those yep. uh, unique situations. Yep. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, uh, that, and we'll probably... That, you can't... As, I was principal, so I know how important um, the rule, the violation, mm -hmm. and the... Uh, repercussion from it. Mm -hmm. if, if they don't mesh, yeah. you got nothing. Yeah. And the, the parents got everything. Mm -hmm. so they brought a lawyer in, which yeah. just happens yeah. half the time. So um, I, I really appreciate the fact that you're going through this again. Mm -hmm. But uh, I also say, just like Eva did, you know, learn from others before you have to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. That's so, what we're did doing. You look at I have not Photo looked conduct. at Evitz as thoroughly as I have. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, I'll give so, it to you. I'm sure. <laughs> I got I'm happy to look at it. <laughs> I, I, just, I just think this is so important, and not just for us, but for students and parents. Mm -hmm. um, and if a, and if a parent says, I don't agree with this, then this might not be the place for you. That's pure and simple. That, that's Even it's fortunate because it's got a different set of rules of who can come and who can't. But yeah. I've always said, when I got in trouble here in, in Fountain Hills, and I'll, I'll get in trouble again. Um, it's a privilege to come to Fountain Hills, um, not a right. I don't care where you live. We can accept you or not. You can accept us or not. Um, that's my philosophy, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> Libby? So I, 
Was there a template that you used for this code of conduct? Um, template as in like like how I formatted type things, of things. Well, just or where what you to include, the what to not. Yeah. Like I said, this is a compilation of looking at various codes of conduct of neighboring districts, kind of what Dana was mentioning in regards to how EVIT put theirs together and mm -hmm. making sure, because I think one of the things that Dana shared was, you know, if you can't agree to this as a parent or a student, maybe Fountain Hills isn't the place for you. But the thing of it is, if you go over the hill, if you go down the 87, you're going to see thing. identical things in these codes of conducts in neighboring districts. So well, I just found it interesting that it was word for word almost identical to Scottsdale because mm -hmm. I looked up others. So <clears throat> I just wondered if it yeah. was a template from. Yeah, is it from at, who authored it? Like, did yeah. we. Right now it's in draft. Form. So what he's yeah, done is just taking a compilation of what other districts are doing and then we would put it into our own format and do all that. Okay. Yeah. Is there. Um, is there a code of conduct committee or is there any input on it or is it kind of all on like i said it has definitely it? not all been on me no as okay. far as putting the document together yes but it's been discussions amongst us in the district office as well as at the sites mm -hmm. okay so there's no formal committee though correct it's not made up of parents or anything like that it's just district office staff that's working on it okay good. um so at this point have any changes been made in this draft to think like reflective of our community or our students and our parents and, or is it kind of just generic yes yeah I don't think there's anything specific to Fountain Hills that you wouldn't see in another district um, you know a, a drug violation in every district I've been in is a nine-day or expulsion right mm -hmm. first offense second mm -hmm. offense is a automatic <laughs> expulsion hearing so those those types of things it's kind of like when you look at your your as policies right every every district has the template and then they 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 make it work for them by their regulations and by which ones they adopt and which ones they possibly change and things of that nature so this is a starting point for us of, of gathering all the data and, and getting feedback from you of what what are things that are concerning and things that we don't want to, to address or maybe things we don't want in there or that you think something should be added. Is it custom for districts to have just a uniform code of conduct? I, I saw that later it is it does have things broken down into like K through five, six yes. through eight. But is it mm -hmm. custom just for the one mm -hmm. for the district? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, going back, um, we had some classroom rules uh, that each teacher has for their classroom, which is the way it works. Mm -hmm. uh, they just can't vary from the code of conduct. Yeah, they can't do like less than. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, I'm a corporal punishment guy. I had a paddle. And, <laughs> um, and I used it all the time when I was in the classroom. Um, but that was my rule. Uh, the district kind of frowned on that, but that was me. Uh, now <laughs> I've got all geeks, and the last thing I need to do is a paddle. <laughs> but certain, so thing, certain things in here you don't have like a principal does not have the ability to say you brought drugs to school and I'm not going to discipline right. you. And that's important to right. to you you know you don't want administrators mm -hmm. giving one punishment to one person and a totally different punishment somewhere else. Now there are situations that do come up where the you know the um, you know the severity of that issue has has moved it to maybe the maximum versus the minimum. Um, I think we have done here this year, there have been certain things that we have done the max on on every single one. And that includes, you know, um, we've moved into the, my expectation to principals, anything that was uh, fighting, harassment, drugs, alcohol, any racial, you know, comments, things that, that fall into those categories went right to the max because those are unacceptable. There was some others in there too. I'm just thinking off the top of my head. But, and then there's others that where, you know, you may have you know, a defiant situation. Well, that could mean a lot of things. And so that's where the principal or the assistant principal has that ability to look at the situation and decide, does that fall into a minimum or a maximum category? Yeah. And most of the principals are pretty good about calling Chris or I for advice on something that's pretty major to see what our thoughts are on it or to give them advice. And I try not to tell them, this is what you have to do. I give them maybe the other side of it. Like, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? You know, 
and try to get, let them come to a decision they feel comfortable with. And uh, I've also asked them to not rush to, to judgment on things. And, you know, if something happens at 145, you don't have to have it done by 220. There's nothing wrong with, you know, taking the next day and having the kid come in and, you know, they work maybe up in the office while you're finishing the investigation so you're thorough and you get it right. And so that's been important to us too. There are situations that legally we have to do certain mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. reporting-wise, yes. for example. Right. Arizona City. Right. And um, it doesn't make a difference if it's two minutes before the end of the day. You've yeah. got an obligation to report it to Child Protective Services. Yes, right. right. Yeah. yeah, those things are totally different. I'm just saying, like, if you have a, a um, you know, maybe a, a bullying issue that you can't solve in, in that moment, you should still be calling parents. You should still be doing all those steps to to make sure it's being done correctly, but you may not have it resolved in that short of a time. You have to investigate, go through that process. And um, so, yeah. How about, um, and I just briefly looked at it, I sort of studied it totally, but dress code? Mm -hmm. It's um, in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, but um, I just thought, you know, I'm, I work at Edith. We have dress <laughs> code, right? Um, you have to wear a uniform. The geekdom, we wear bowling shirts. Go figure. But um, I, I just think that's in the community. You talked about a community. You know, this community uh, is really behind a dress code. Well, the, there was a dress code committee, and this is what the dress code committee came up with. I know. So this is only a, the dress code committee is only a few years old, um, and it was made up of teachers, parents, and administration. So um, the problem is that I, I don't feel that the dress code is enforced. So, I mean, it's clear in here, it's just not enforced. It is hard to enforce. And, you know, I mean, I kind of laughed, the one thing, because actually I'm sitting on the dress code right now, <coughs> is that, <laughs> like, yeah, that's the page that was up, that it says elementary age students must wear closed-toed shoes. What? Yeah. No, I mean, they never do. So, you know, I mean, girls wear sandals. Mm -hmm. I'm a flip-flop girl. I've worn them since I was, like, five. So, you the, know, the it's trust would, like that. The trust would have... Yeah, uh, I know. I know. But, I'm just <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. but, but it's not it's, enforced. Right. right, it's not enforced. I mean, it's yeah. fine that it's in here, but it's not enforced. But, yeah, you know, clothing that covers body, private body parts, genitals, buttocks, chest, nipple, or navels. Well, there's a lot of half shirts walking around that high school. And, you know, the, the pajama <laughs> pants that hang down low below yeah. their belly button. And, you know, so that's... I mean, I would rather see the dress code enforced than actually changed but yeah. then from the flip side i will tell you that we've had teachers who have enforced the dress code and we've actually had parents pull their kids because of it yeah. because they will not have a man tell their daughter what she can and cannot wear it's, so it's, it, it's we're a in a bad you know it's yeah. like yeah so yeah, i think i think if the dress code you know was just updated that you know, we keep that in there and we we sure. you know that that just was done so you leave that as is and we can have further discussion about it I know it's a it's a big issue in a lot of districts that are are, are looking at, um, you know, that in a lot of different ways and how it affects kids and sometimes disproportionately. So, there there are things that we we can look at down the road of that. Um, like I said, we have a code of conduct in place right now. This is not a doesn't have to be done tomorrow. This is a, a, a probably a long process. Mm -hmm. But I think what we're looking for is is that Chris has compiled things that our neighboring districts do, is there things in here that you you like about it? And, and then are there things that you don't like? Because this is not ours, I'm going to tell you. Like, this is ours is the first three pages. And, and it probably should be, you know, I don't know if it has to be 40 pages, but maybe it needs to be 20 pages, right? There just has to be more, more to it that, that we are missing out on so that our principals have a guide that they feel that they're going to be backed on by not only, you know, us, but also the governing board feels like, hey, we've reviewed this and we support these decisions that principals are making. And we try not, you know, suspension is always the last thing you want to do, but there are times where, you know, that that, that has to happen for the, maybe the campus to heal, you know, maybe for the kid to reflect and realize what their actions have really done to the school. And so... There, there are alternatives to um, discipline that we can continue to implement, 
Um, but there are some that, that have to be, I think, non-negotiables, or else you accept that behavior in your district, and you can't have that. Well, we've done a lot of rubrics, even when it comes to matching the rule against the mm -hmm. rest of it. So um, we're familiar with those, obviously for grading purposes, but it really works well. I mean, I've got a book that has every violation. It's got its rubric. I say, this is you. What, you know, what's the deal? Um, you know, yeah. You're out of here. Yeah, and we've created those. I, I had one as principal years ago. That I had a, a one pager for my assistant principals, like you know, for the most common things that we deal with, and you just go straight across. And it had a lot of what's in here summarized in, in a one page laminated document. And the goal is to get back to that, so they have that right there to go by. But when everyone's speaking the same language at all three sites, you talk about you know being unified. This this helps us be unified, and. What a what a th you know a second grader does they don't have the same understanding of what a tenth grader has done and so you have to think about the fact that uh, in some of those issues you want you want to you probably start with some of those as a conversation trying to teach them that this is bad and here's why it's bad versus where you know in high school they know it's bad and they did it anyway right so um, having it broke up by that gives us a little bit more flexibility by grade level too. I think, Madison, you, you had asked earlier, you know, are there things in here that are uniquely specific to our district? And one that sticks out is the closed campus. It's something that, you know, Kane and I have talked about this and, and trying to keep that. We've had that in mind with um, the new schedule at the high school. So that, that language is all entirely us because if you look around, no most, most districts Perfect. don't do that. They don't permit it. Um, it's, it's a luxury that we afford our juniors and seniors, and we mm -hmm. feel they've been responsible with it, and we want to continue with that. So... There's, there's definitely some things that are uniquely to us and specific to us. Right. So I have three kind of questions mm -hmm. from reading it. In one part, it referenced our policy, board policy, J-I-C-K, and that talks about the student bullying, harassment, intimidation. And in that policy, it says, the district shall identify and implement age-appropriate programs designed to instill students the values of positive interpersonal relationships. Do we have that at each site? Not at think? this time, but so there are, but like for example, we had years ago that I'd like to bring back, uh, we had what's called the refocus room. And we found that at the high school, kids you know, who were struggling in a classroom and disrupting the learning of others were able to be removed for, that period, for a period of time. But it wasn't just go sit in the office, it was they went to the intervention counselor um, they had a, um, you know, at the time they had a survey they filled out. Um, the survey was more of why, what did you do to get here? What were your actions? How did those actions affect others? What adult on campus do you feel comfortable speaking with? Um, how are you going to fix this situation and rectify, or, you know, uh, repair that relationship? And then we had the habits of mind. Which habits of mind could you utilize to, to make better choices? When a kid went down and reflected, it took them about 20 minutes to do all this. When they got done, a lot of times they, they were calm and ready to go back to class and they could go back to class. So they missed a little bit of instruction time, but they also reflected on why they were down there and how it affects others. Sometimes the teacher said they can't come back today, they can come back tomorrow and they do the reflection, then they would sit with Jason and maybe do a different, you know, work on some homework or something like that. But the data that came in on that was very eye-opening to us because when a, when a student said, I have no one on this campus I feel comfortable with, that's a huge red flag, right? We, we have to address that. Um, but a lot of times the kids came to a realization of, man, you know, the, the, this was not, I, I, you know, I, I realized that I just had a bad morning and, and I probably took it out on that teacher and I probably shouldn't have and here's how I'm gonna rectify the situation. And what we found when we did our A-plus application is, is that the number of kids that went down there a second time was like 30 total kids in the school. And the number that went to a third time, I don't have the application for me, but it was like nine. So, so basically what we found is when a kid went down there, they, real, they rarely went back. They learned from it and they're like, I don't want to go do that again. Or I, I, I understand that my actions have a negative effect on others. So, so that is something we could look to bring back. There's no questions in there that or anything outside of just reflecting on the situation. And it gave us some data to be able to help the kids and in our school with, you know, if we're seeing the same kind of discipline over and over again, we can put something in place to address that. 
They used to have something like that at McDowell Mountain. Oh, my, well, they have the reset. Yeah. And it was mm -hmm. like, Do you remember what that room was called? <laughs> they have a reset room now, right? They, they have had, a sensory room now, but. Also, I don't really yeah. There was something they same, same like premise because yeah. I remember it had an in, like hip attention, so he had to do it on the stage in the, during the lunchroom time, and he had to fill out the form oh. in kinder. It was yeah, like barely writing. It was I know. Kinda, yeah, yeah. So no, it, there was a room that uh -huh. when Katie was, I remember when she was in first grade, like yeah, that they would send kids down to, mm -hmm. and and it was for kids who well, were having behaviors. Yeah, they have a reset room now. Um, from what I understand, the kids can use it if they feel like they're going to escalate. Mm -hmm. Although I did. When I spoke with Kevin about it, I was worried that it would, in some ways, incentivize mm. kids acting up, which he has seen a little bit of that. So that's. The only well, you adjust. I mean, yeah. like I said, you can't. And I told the teachers years ago, if you all are sending kids down, that program is going to go real fast. Like right. this is a last. You know, you use all your classroom management skills, and this is, this is just not working today. And I need to get the rest of the class where they need to be. But again, you're. It, but that was a when kids reflected and they talked to us afterward they said this is one of the more positive ways i've been disciplined in the past it wasn't come down sit there in the office the rest of the period possibly you know have someone yell at them or tell them all the things they're doing wrong they came to the conclusion of what they did wrong and how they can be better with it and then there was a conversation with the administrator before they went back of it looks like you've come up with a great plan it looks like you're going to go talk to that teacher tomorrow and try to rectify this a call went home to the parent your child was in, you know, was sent here, and here's here's a result of that. So it's different, obviously, with kindergartner than it yeah, is with yeah, high school. Yeah, yeah. Um, it might be, it may be the, the that is just a conversation with the kid, walking mm -hmm. through, like, why are you here, and who have you who have you hurt by being right. acting this way, and how are you going to be better, and let's let's come up with a plan together of how you're going to fix this tomorrow, mm -hmm. and then as a result of this, let's not see you back down here again, yeah. and if yeah. you do a great job, you know. Frank will come see you Friday, you know, something like that. But we do, the teachers, when we put it in, they loved it. They absolutely loved it. And it worked really well at the high school. Um, and I think at the middle school, I've already talked to Kim about something similar to that. Because if you look at our PBIS data um, at the middle school, the vast majority of their instances are in the classroom. They're not in the hallways and in the lunch periods, the unstructured time. It's actually in structured time. Now, part of that is... We've had some subs in those rooms this year that we need to, you know, we're already well on our way to hiring, and I'm super excited about four hires that we've already pretty close to either made or have closed that are top, top people. Like, these are the people you want in the organization coming in. So I do think that some of, in a sub, it's hard for a sub. We've, I've done it myself where you just don't have the knowledge of the kids, the, you don't have the background, so we're putting them in a really tough spot to be able to try to manage that. And so, so using data, we always should have data-driven decisions when it comes to discipline and academics because that's how you get to be, um, that's how you solve problems. You, you can't guess your way through it. You want to know where those problems exist and then put resources in to, to fix that. Yeah. You do know, I, I mean, you guys already know I don't love the, surveys is there a way a way it could just be more of like a self-reflection map where the kids work through it but it's not necessarily all tracked well we don't track it we, we don't just well paper. we track their discipline now okay. yeah every time a kid gets a referral okay. or discipline yeah. it goes into the system in yeah. power school for so when you pull up a kid it goes all the way back to kindergarten mm -hmm. yeah so you can see trends though like fight yeah. here fight here fight here fight here yeah. The goal is to get them the help they need so that the first action isn't violent, right? Mm -hmm. We need to get them the help that they need. So you do have to have that data to be able to help kids get where they need to be, for sure. Libby, you still have more. So my I, second was I'd love to see some different wording rather than restorative practices. Um, that just kind of... It, that's a... Uh, a little edgy. Well, no, that's um, a $20 word. That only requires a nine dollar word to write yeah um so that would be my other request and then finally like i had to laugh because public display of affection like huh. we're telling our high schoolers they can't hold hands in the hallway unfortunately really Trust unfortunately yeah, i don't I think that. that i don't think that's wow. something that it, i ever saw come to my office ever I think it's. I, I remember in high school. I think I, it, I don't think. <laughs> that, but it's a different world. I don't think that is coming up. Yeah, I, yeah I, and that's fine. We don't it's, have to have it's that. It's like in people there. enforcing the open-toed shoes. Yeah. Like you okay. have to have it in there, because 
what yeah. happens is, you know, like somebody touches somebody else and then that person all of a sudden gets mad one day and goes, well, they weren't supposed to touch me. So it, it can escalate even though at first it was okay and now it's not okay. I think so we could pick, I think that could fall into a different category if they did something. I, 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 I don't, dis kids, I don't right. disagree. Takes out, like, the right. of I, I but it's one of those dating. things like yeah. you got to have it in there. You know, it's like McDonald's putting coffee's hot. Don't burn yourself on their cup. Like, <laughs> yeah, well, so that was very hot. There. Yeah, but we, we can, that, like I said, there's some common sense things yeah. that we can look at and say, I, it, you, you know. You know, you talk about that. And, and to me, what the part was sad was birthdays that you can't bring anything. I thought, that's, 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 the health, that's, that's, that's the health department. Yeah. I, I know, know exactly. Yeah. But, but we also yeah. almost are, the other way for that, too. No, I well, I, I, I never know. did myself, but I oh, can yeah. tell you that yeah. you, you know, there's a way to, you know, um, like for banquets and things in the old days, it was coaching, it was prepackaged, you know, bring, you know, those kinds of things. So yeah. there's a way, there's ways to still, you know, you have to have parties in elementary school and you yeah. have to have. But they bring in prepackaged stuff. Yes, yeah, so there's I, ways to do it appropriately. They have a whole really list. Said, like you can bring like, those things though. Well, well because here's why. Because it violates, not, it violates our, it yeah, violates our lunch contract, some of right. those things. So, so, yeah. so as long as it doesn't <laughs> compete with lunch. <laughs> That's okay. And you make sure yeah. there's no But I'm with you. There, there are some things in there that... You know who's allergic to nuts? Yeah. Right? yeah. I know. It's sad. The, health, the county health department will, will yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you, and, and you bring up a good point, Lillian, where you have a situation where I just saw one recently where, you know, somebody somebody did, you know, die from and something at a, that a teacher yeah. gave. That was and the so, granola bar. Yeah, so, so you want to be careful of... Yeah. I get we all look at it and say, you know, we get it, but at the same time, when we put it as policy, when something goes wrong and it's not there, then then you have an issue. And so I think that's going back to what Jill's saying with the hand holding. Is that, right. you know, you you there are things that you have to have in there just so that you don't have you're not opening yourself up to saying uh -huh. that this is you you condone this behavior. Um, yeah, so I every, think there's... Every principal could write a book on all this stuff. Oh, right, gosh. and the elementary schools, at least when my kids were there, each teacher at the beginning of the year would hand out the approved snack list. And so, you know, right, it, and they were, they came from peanut-free factories, so like Rice Krispie Treats, Oreos, you know, there were things that you could bring. Um, I wouldn't be in those days. Rice Krispie treats. Rice Krispie yeah. treats and Oreos. Not anymore. Um, That's a diabetic issue. Right. So, yep. other other feedback for Chris? Um, the, I have they take all the fun the, out of stuff. Yeah. The survey for the parental parent legal guardian consent to participate for participation in social emotional behavior screening. I was not a fan of that. Um, it, where was it? What page? Uh, it's six. page twenty of the packet, but page six of the code of conduct. Okay. Um, it says, uh, is a brief screening tool for universal screening of student risk for social emotional and behavior problems for students in grades K through 12. Um, you, I did ask Kane about that, and he said it was, wasn't something that we do to every student. Is that correct? This is just for when parents seek it out? It could be when parents seek it out or one of the educators on campus feels that it may be necessary. And so this is what we would utilize to get permission to move forward with yeah. set screening. We don't have any set screenings at this time. We don't time. currently okay. have that now. Who provides the screening? Is it would, it, the be, safe, it would be school psychologists okay. that would do that. Same as a, a special ed. Um, right. Sometimes the parent will, sometimes staffing gets we'll together. There's no one person that can do that. Right. Um, it takes a team. Because mm -hmm. sometimes it has to be if the teacher notices something. Bring it up. This could be something brought to SST during that process to review. And this, this isn't even, we wouldn't even use this form. This isn't our form, but it's just to show you that this is what other districts do. Correct. So again, if this is something we it's, don't, if this is something we don't need in there, since we don't currently have anything, but I, what I don't want to do is we want to have something in place for, you know, a family or a parent who, who does want social and emotional support for their children and they do want that we we, we got to find a way to support them in that regard and yeah. sometimes like i said it could be part of an iep or part of their plan to have some kind of you know so it wouldn't be to everybody but it would be possibly to a child in need so yeah. usually well, um, usually spec it um and the special you know my history is you know autistic spectrum 
is where that all falls into. And that's where you work with the parent and their resources outside of the school. Mm -hmm. We're just one other resource for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I, I just, I think there's a lot about the social emotional learning, which I would actually like to request that that be a discussion item as well. And maybe we could have people like Sharon who understand it present and be able to ask some questions. Because there are some things there that that still concern me and that I know are of a concern, are of concerns to parents. Um, but yeah, I wasn't looking at that. I think it's a good discussion now because like I've shared with a lot of you specifically, um, there's there's not really, in my opinion, there's not one thing that, that resolves that, right? It's, I mean, there's a lot of things that go into helping kids with those issues, right? Yeah. From, from Frank to counselors to intervention counselors to psychologists to IEP plans. So there's a lot of things that go into it. And we don't have any district, you know, curriculum or any district, you know. Well, we do use some programs at the school sites yeah. for curriculum. At for, the lower levels, yes. Yeah. And Kevin to me, has. some of those, some of the things I've seen from those programs mm -hmm. are very concerning because they're definitely leading the discussion when I, I don't feel like, again, I don't think that that's our stewardship. Um, I think that we do deal in, obviously, public, social interaction but again that's where a, a an expectation of behavior is placed and then you know situations are dealt with kind of on a mm -hmm. case by case so we basis. can talk about that another time and Thank it you. just so happened that i, I got an email with a definition or fact fiction kind of thing on on that so i'll send it to krista yes and, and then she can send it she can send it to the board and, and yeah she to, can send it to everybody it just got that today so. to go along with that when we request something like that be on a discussion or as a discussion item if i have research that i've done and things that i would like to present do i just send that to krista so that everybody can have it or do I just yep. bring it to yep. okay. Yep. okay perfect yeah it all has to go through krista for her to send Okay, okay, so I think cool. where we can kind of maybe end today is Chris is going to mm -hmm. take a look at EBITs. I think that's a good mm -hmm. look. Yeah. Add that to this comp compilation. Um, I know he's looked at, you know, um, at our most closest neighbors of Mesa and Scottsdale. Mm -hmm. um, Paradise Valleys is very, very similar. Um, I used it for many, many years there. Um, I don't, there's, I wouldn't be able to tell a difference probably between the two. You start um, reading word for word ours to Scott's. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. identical. Right. Well, well, remember, we ours is those first three pages. Mm -hmm. Well, but the rest the of the one. But this yeah. is just a compilation of what's out there. I mean, it, the it, and that's that every district yeah. would have similar. Yeah. Where are we at with wordsmithing? Because that's my other concern is just that there's some places where I feel like the wording is not. Well, I think you highlight great, it and so then you bring it, it and send it to Chris. Mm -hmm. is, you know, I think you can, you know, if you have certain concerns that we. We're going to have more discussion. Like I said, we yeah, do I not have that. to have this in place by August. We have a code of conduct. It's working. We've held, you know, we, we've been able to Those hold students. Hold strong. Hold, <laughs> we've been able to hold students accountable for, for behaviors based on what we have. And, and, I, and I use this many, many times. And um, it's, it is short and sweet and to the point. But I think that the idea is that um, there, there maybe needs to be a little bit more separation by grade level, a little mm -hmm. bit more separation, although maybe um, some things need to be held a little stronger. I, I like that there's, you know, in Scottsdale's, there's the appendix page, pages in the back, which hit on three big, big areas, right? It hits on um, drugs and alcohol, it hits on weapons, and it hits on harassment and, and, and racial, um, um, you know, issues that are happening that need to be addressed. And so having those, you know, as separate appendixes, I like that it, it, it shows a parent that this gets a separate section because of how yeah. egregious mm -hmm. it is and how right. important it is that we have high standards on those things. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it gives the principals a little bit more to work with saying that not only is this a maximum level discipline issue, but our code of conduct has even outlined in there how serious of an infraction mm -hmm. that is. So okay. anything you want to wordsmith, again, send to Krista. Yeah, because the board out. should only communicate through Krista, okay. Okay, not okay. directly to yeah, my, my apology for that. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Send so, it to Krista, uh, she'll get it yeah. out. One last thing that I saw both in our current and the proposed one um, is that the parents' students will be informed. Is 
I think third on both of them is, are the parents informed the first time that a kid has a disciplinary issue or, or is it just the reminding them of the expectation? Well, the and first then level the is a student conversation. So a kid running in the hallway at a high school, probably not making a phone call, call home. Yeah. It's gonna be, hey, come here for a minute. Is this how you act? No, okay, I'm sorry, you know. That's fine, Just I just want you to know you don't do it. Now they do it again, then yeah, then it's probably a phone call home okay. and it's probably, mm -hmm. you know, it amps up. So it's progressive discipline. Yeah. And so a first offense is gonna be treated differently than a second or a third offense. And so, um, and that's, that's tracked through Power School and PBIS app, depending on, on the minors are in PBIS and the majors are in, are in Power School. I think one of the things, Kate, and I stress with the principals too is, the kid's coming down to your office or the dean's office or the assistant principal's office, regardless if it's positive or negative. Call. Call mom and dad. Yeah. Let no, them I had, know. I had the kid call mom and dad. Yeah. Well, I didn't really call <laughs> just, well, I like that too. I know but, my kids yeah, right. came home from school and we were at dinner and they said, hey, I was in principal's. I'm like, what? Why? Right. You know? And so mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't want that as a parent to be surprised at dinner yes. that night. Yeah. And I right. think that, you know, we've just talked to the, to the building leaders and said, you know, just extend that courtesy. And don't, Whether it's a positive practice. conversation, mm -hmm. it's a best yeah. practice. And don't policy, email. But Pick up no. the phone. Yeah. Right. Call. Yeah. It, it's, it's a two-minute phone call, it's right? A, it's, it's very short. It's very quick. And Baca is notorious for making that student call yes. and explain what that student <laughs> did because that's her theory i'm not calling your parent you call your parent yeah, tell them what you did wrong. You right. call yeah. so right. that, that really um, scares the crap out of the kid first oh, mm -hmm. it has I, I know of one instance where a, a student was very upset that he had to call his parent and Bach was like oh, too bad yep. and mm -hmm. he stopped doing what he had been doing <laughs> so, but, so but bring up parents i think i, I get all these um, education um daily news things, half a dozen of them. What trends in some is parental responsibility. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it, uh, parent, parents are as responsible as the student for those three fractions you just talked about. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And others as well, but those yeah. specific. <laughs> and I think we need to start um, letting parents know that, yeah. you know, you're, you can go to jail for something yes. your kid did. That's happening more and more all the time. Well, that's where we get the SRO involved and in those issues, and they have those conversations with well, them. Well, we had so. when we were over at middle school that one day. Yeah. Um, you know? Yeah. So before, but yeah. before we move on, you have insisted almost this entire night that any conversations go through Dr. J and Krista, and I understand your reasoning why, but I want to refer to our board policy, BCA, Letter D, it says, encourage the free expression of opinion by all board members and seek systematic communication between the board and students, staff, and all elements of the community. Mm -hmm. sure. So I think by saying, you know, Dana encouraged us to sit at oh, the yeah, county, absolutely. right? Yeah. And if we can't email Chris on a topic that he's brought it to discussion in a board meeting, I have no problem CCing Kane or Krista, but I think that's violating our board policy and telling I think there's us actually another shouldn't. board policy about um, board and employee discussion yeah. mm -hmm. and so oh, that I think you yeah. need to review our yeah policy. so it, it, it's just good practice this, to work through because right uh, well, open meeting laws through him. Mm -hmm. lawyers need to make money and there's way too many of them. <laughs> and so you know, when I was on the county board oh my gosh four times a month we had a lawyer uh, would you know, submit on behalf of a student or, or somebody else an open meeting law violation because he witnessed a phone call which may or may not have even occurred, but they're getting you know per diem or whatever it is yeah, for Yeah, and we can look at those policies, but I can't quote the policy to you sure. right now, but there is a policy about um, the board and employee uh, conversations. Yeah. So well, but it, that's where I we just, have to separate the board and board office. members. Correct. Because as, if if I'm acting just as a person, you can't. contacting when you're acting in here or anything with a district employee, you are acting as a board that's member, right. which is part of the board. Right. You but you represent me. <laughs> but I'm not right. Yeah. If I'm interacting with Mrs. Monar because she has my child right. in her class, as a parent, I'm interacting as a parent. Parent. There yeah. Is, there but is a I'm line just there. saying when you're Correct. acting. When you are asking for information that is board, that's only accessible because you're a board member, you are acting on behalf of the board as a board member. So when you're communicating with staff about policies, procedures, finance, anything like that, 
it's a board thing. It's not a you thing. So that's where, you, you know. And, and the hard part is it's, it's hard that. to separate the position. So even for myself, like going to deal with some of my children, yeah. it doesn't matter that I'm a parent. I'm still to that teacher or that employee. I'm still mm -hmm. the superintendent. And so when we go and talk to our staff, you know, a lot of times, you know, if we do it in a process of like, hey, you know, I want to visit this campus, I want to take a tour, you know, working through us so that we can set that up and we can make it a positive experience. You know, if you have a question for a staff member working through us so we can work through that with them, um, it just, it helps, it helps streamline the process of our staff feeling supported and feeling like, you know, um, you know, because a lot of times, even when I say, give me a quick call, they're nervous, you know, the whole day now. What, what, what's the question? It's just like, I just wanted to see if you, you know, if this worked out for you or something like that. So I think we just have to establish ways that we're going to communicate collectively with, with, our, with our staff. Okay? okay. All right. I'd say parents uh, as board members, and there's case law where um, is it you, if, well, you, if you walk to your teacher, you're still a board member. You can't deny that, and even though you're a parent. So it's a, it's a tough line. Uh, as, a, as a board member and a parent, you kind of give up some parental rights because you represent four other people every time you talk to somebody. Yes, you're always seen as a board member, but you also hold no power as one individual person. Right. It's not like I can Could, actually go in and intimidate anybody. But not everybody knows. It's oh, but, yeah, right. but you do intimidate. You do, yeah. Uh, just your I've presence. Been there. <laughs> No, but what we're saying I is just that think not that, everyone that we, understands that. So when, the, when what when we she talk, quoted is encouraging candid conversation, it's yeah. again, it's not. I think the other policy is probably to stop any kind of imitation, like intimidation. Intimidation, intimidation. yeah. But I mean, it's, it's just, one thing if you're going and asking about your own child and saying how's he doing in school, but if you're going to be talking about anything else that could be discussed here. That's where the difference comes. So well, then you shouldn't be going to coffee. Well, we the well, I don't the, say anything. Well, it, 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 I just, but the attorney but did say that that I thought they did discourage that yeah. when we met that's with why, when we met with him. That's why I stopped going. Yeah, he yeah, discouraged I, I, that. I've gone to one or two, but I sit in the corner and just listen. So I think I think what we can we we can bring him back and get some clarification. I just think that what 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 we perceive and what a, what a staff member perceives are two different things, right? So, so when, when, when someone comes and talks to them, they don't, they don't maybe understand that, what that person's role is or that they are speaking individually or as, as representation of the whole group. And so for a staff member, I think any time that, they're, you know, that that comes up, it's, it probably you know, has some kind of effect on them. So I think there's just a way to do it. Like when I, when I was principal in Scottsdale, and a board member wanted to tour, they reached out to the superintendent, superintendent reached out to me, we set up the date and the time, he did not come with, it was just myself and that member, we walked the campus, we had a great conversation for about an hour, we went into some classrooms, and that was, that was the extent of it, but it was all set up so that I could let the staff know that, hey, I'm bringing somebody by, if you have any questions or you'd like to meet them, you know, you can do that, so that was kind of the purpose of it. I, I, I can see the purpose for yeah. it, but I guess that I just, and this isn't anything to you, but again, we're not accountable to the superintendent. We're accountable to the mm -hmm. the community and mm -hmm. and the staff and the students. But you also and don't employ the staff. I understand that, so which is why I have no him. power to do anything well, except for as a board. <laughs> and well, you do. I think that yeah. we need to make sure that we protect the... I know, but like if you send him a request, and now he works for him, he doesn't work for you technically, mm -hmm. he works for him. So now, you know, Chris will have to go to Kane and be like, hey, they're asking for this. And so Kane's involved anyway. And then Kane can bring it to the board. Right. Exactly. Right. So well, I think that's how it's almost meant to but happen. But you should go to Kane first. Kane first. Yeah. And let but him, could, let could him see, see both. Yeah. yeah. Because it might not be Chris who needs to respond to it. So it's just, it's just best It just practice. makes it easier for us to run right. the, the organization when we know what's ha what's being requested and what, what we need to assist with because, like she said, everything that comes, like you could go talk to a, a staff member, they could take it completely the wrong way and the f first thing they're going to do is go to their principal, principal's going to come to me and then it's an issue that we got to address. So I think just the more, we're all, we all believe in, um, I think we've made it very clear, we have an open door policy, we want people on our campuses, 
every, you know, any parent wants to come see me, I never turn them away, ever, all right? Um, we take feedback all the time. That's the purpose of the coffees. That's the purpose of, you know, any surveying we do. So I think we all want the same thing. We just want to do it in a way that keeps our, our staff moving forward positively so that they can uh, do the things that they need to do. And it's yeah. not easy. I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody. Everything you just said. Well, yeah, and I don't think the goal is to not inform you. Just the walking just, on the campus, yeah. I don't think anything of it, especially in the early days, because right. I was the announcer for the football yeah. team, I was on the booster club, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and yet, uh, I got called on the carpet, and uh, and it, I said, "Are you kidding me? That happened? It did." And you know, and that's happened unfortunately way more than I want to say because I don't get it sometimes. Well, and that's I've been here 18 years, and you know. I've known most of these teachers long before I was a PT, you know, when I, long before I was a governing board member, but the relationship changed once I became a governing board member yeah. because all of a sudden there was that boundary that they, you know, they so, used to talk to me and then they couldn't. So, so we can have Nick come back and clarify. I think he mm -hmm. did a great job. Yeah. I really appreciated his, his, his knowledge and his approach to things. And all those things are, are just to, to have good process, right? We want to have good process in what we do. Okay, right. we should move on. We only have uh, about 20 minutes. We still have a few things to get um, moving on. Thank you for all your hard work on that, Chris. It's greatly appreciated. Okay, next up is Portrait of a Graduate <clears throat> with Dr. J. Yeah, so this is something um, that we've been working on um, through our strategic plan committee. And um, so there's a lot of different ways that we came up with these six goals. So one is through strategic planning, working with that stakeholder group of what their what you know what their their feedback is and things that they, they want to see the district move in, in a certain direction, um, areas for growth, areas that need to be addressed. Um, also, uh, all the feedback that I get from parents in uh, coffee sessions, um, conversations I have with them. Um, and then lastly, even uh, our students. So our students contributed this at the high school level as they are getting ready to graduate. And I asked them, I gave them a list of various skills and said, which are the ones that you think are the most important for you to have going into either college or career and into adulthood as you graduate from high school? And so the good news is, is that what the students identified aligned very, very nicely with what our staff, our, our strategic plan group uh, uh, aligned with, and, and a lot of what we talk about in, in uh, the feedback I get from parents as well, from the survey on um, the schedule to uh, different um, things we've discussed in, again, in those, those parent coffee sessions. And so what we, what we came up with was um, six skills that we believe students uh, need and will help them be successful as they, as they graduate from high school. So uh, those skills include leadership, critical thinking, communication, responsibility, being self and goal directed, and problem solving. Um, the other thing that we'd like to do is, out of this, is define what, how that is accomplished at each grade level moving forward. So what is, what is communication, what is, what is critical thinking, leadership, communication look like in kindergarten? What does it look like in first grade? So that when we tour parents and we have parent, prospective parents come to us, there is a, there's, there's a, a, a path of, of what, we're, what we're trying to do for kids to prepare them for the next level. And, and when parents see something that is a graphic, that is something that is, you know, um, that is, you know, the, the, I guess the pillars of what the district's trying to accomplish with our students, um, the skills that they need, that, and, and they can see how that's done at each grade level, I, I do believe that it helps a parent feel comfortable about um, sending their kid here or, or um, understanding what, what skills they're going to have coming out into the job force and into um, college. So I took um, some feedback and, and kind of pieced it together into definitions off to the left. Um, this is, you know, basically for information and, uh, and feedback from you. Um, but the, the, the work of these groups is, is, this is kind of their culminating, one of their culminating pieces. 
And uh, the goal is to then have this available um, in our buildings so that kids and teachers know that these are important skills for, our, for us to teach our kids as they're going through, um, through um, our school district. It's not something they can do on Google. <laughs> right. These are skills that are entrenched, mm -hmm. which I don't, we're, and I, we're doing it it's almost the same exact things you're doing and have for about four or five years now. And it's part of our requirement for our curriculum because our job is to prepare them for the workforce. Right? Mm -hmm. We have a couple of unique ones that are skill-based, you know, welding and so forth. But, you know, that's what industry wants. Uh, we've had those discussions with our employee committees, and um, you can teach nothing else. If they come to me with those skills, I got a good person. And one of them that was close to making the list was the financial literacy, which I was great mm -hmm. to see. So I did yeah. add it to uh, skill yeah, so four. Yeah, I have it under responsibility. Mm -hmm. Because I think it is, it, 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 we yes. should be teaching them that being financially literate is a responsibility they have for mm -hmm. to have a successful life. And so if you're going into the workforce, and as Dana always says, you know, this, this you know, not your workforce, but the new workforce, you know, Companies are looking for students who can be leaders. They, they're not going to always be the leader. They have to be able to, to, to know when to step up and lead. But they, the hope is that through their experiences in our district, they have those leadership skills. Um, the ability to think critically has always been an important piece of um, our you know, teaching kids so that they, they think beyond what is just, you know, this is, this is what we do. But why is that asking those tough questions and coming to a conclusion on their own? Um, we know there's a communication gap with a lot of children today with social media and phones and all, all the, um, the lack of, of human conversation in a lot of times. So um, that, I think a lot of that can be built on our playgrounds and in play like we talked about, um, and as well as in collaboration and project-based learning. Responsibility, it's important to have kids walking out knowing that they have responsibilities in life and that being responsible leads to success. Um, having the ability to, to make goals that are for themselves, but also to have larger goals and more short-term uh, short goals uh, so that they can accomplish those goals and, and, and make a positive contribution uh, to, to their community, to their family, whatever it is. And then lastly, the ability to problem solve, which is such a critical ta uh, need in, in, in 21st century jobs is to be able to... Um, problem solve probably all day long, right? Yeah. Um, not just once in a while, but be able to do that. Paid for. Yeah. So questions you have, any concerns you have? No, and responsibility would be nice if there would be some way to putting uh, something about showing up, coming to work, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> for those one. that don't always come or think that it's okay if I come late for school mm. or I, I was, just, you know, I was kind of hoping with hard work that that, that's what I'm, that yeah. we can we can hammer that home, you right. know that, you know that's Frank's big thing: work hard and be nice, you know. And so mm -hmm. when you're when you work hard, you're going to find success, and that's what I talked to the chamber about. It doesn't right. matter if you you have the highest sales numbers or win the trophy at the end. If you work hard, you're going to be successful because you work hard. So that that is in there, and I think right. we can teach that mm -hmm. being on time and being somewhere where you're supposed to be is part of that hard work process. And there's just one thing, and it, it's my husband's pet peeve. And the last one, problem solving. Uh, after complex problems, using technology, do not use the word utilizing. And if you ever need yeah. him to come and explain why, he will. Because okay. <laughs> it's like, he just That's goes crazy. Point. There's no reason to, to use the word utilizing. Yeah. It is not proper. It should be using. Point taken. <laughs> you know, we've had these discussions now, at, at even other places for a long time. And, and the one thing that comes up, um, which I agree with, the school district has students 15% of their time. Parents have responsibility for the 85% of the time. So even though for that 15% we're pushing these things, if it isn't happening during that 85%, it ain't going to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's, I mean, the hope is that we do, if, if we're doing this, if these are skills that we agree as a district are important and we're doing it for a kid like mine that have been here their whole career, 
by the time they graduate, the hope is that they've done so yeah. much of this that that 15% has made a difference. Yeah. And honestly, yeah. sometimes they see do. the difference. Yeah. They'll see that at school things work differently yeah. than it does at home when they're right. not Especially adhering with their to things. I do like that this is forward looking and not just to get them through school. It's not just all academic focused. However, I do again have concerns with influences of social emotional learning. Where's that? And how, no, just in how these things will be cultivated and how are we tracking? We're not well, tracking. We're not great okay. tracking. This is just something we're yeah. in atmosphere. There's a focus on leadership. To. So in kindergarten, you know, you might be starting out as. You're, you're the line leader, or you're right. in charge of this group, or you're in charge of this task. And and as you grow more down, leadership in high school might be you're, you're the president of a club, and you're the captain of a team, or you're, um, you know, in your AP capstone group, you're, you have, for one of the major projects, you're, you're the lead on that. So it varies as you go, but we have, regardless of social motive, these are skills kids have to have. I mean, they yeah. can't not have these skills when they get into the workforce. Can I go back to, I, what is your favorite saying? It wasn't the not your... we got to prepare but, students for their future, not, not our past. Not right. So I'm looking at this feeling that we're preparing our kinder students, 13, you know, mm -hmm. our kids going into kinder, we're looking at implementing something mm -hmm. that will be their past. So 13 years down the road, these skills are going to be vastly different. They could be. And that's... We're not preparing for their future. We're looking. Well, we don't know what that is. Yes. Right. Yeah. So I, I feel like this isn't, it's kind of busy work. We're not really focusing on raising our academic test scores well, and focusing on the basics. Studies show that in 20 years with technology, yeah. we won't need English. There won't be an English or a Spanish because the technology will take care of our communication. Well, um, why are we still teaching English? It is relevant into a kindergarten. These are good skills to have. If they don't need them when they're sixth grade, they, have, they needed them when they were kindergarten. But I think all these skills have st stood the test of time. Like yeah. highly successful people Absolutely. hit all those things. And, sure. and mm -hmm. yeah, things are going to change, but we can't say in 13 years there's not going to be leadership needs or yeah. the ability to communicate. Mm -hmm. Like those How are things. How we do it might be different. Yeah, right. so I, I right. get like there, there could be some things that, you know, um, you know, there's there's things we've done in schools that we no longer do anymore because they're not relevant. And there, you talked about the calendar, right? I mean, that, I, I agree. Um, that got Good, no let's take th that, that got no that got no traction. Okay, um, I know. but but that's why I feel that these are good because they're not they're not just current buzzwords. These are things that have stood the test of time. I mean. You, if you don't have the ability to, to be set self goals for yourself and and reach those goals, no matter what time period you live in throughout history, that's going to be a problem for you, right? And so, yeah, technology is going to replace some of the things we do, but I don't think that's always a good thing myself personally yeah. because it takes away from your personal responsibility. Uh, you know, I I just I, I have different opinion on that. Like I've had people say. Why do kids need to learn geography when they look it up on their phone? Well, because I think when you're having a conversation with someone, they should understand what East Coast and West Coast means and where oceans are and things of that nature. I still think those are important things for us to have. So um, some of that we, are, we can't do anything about. That's just going to happen, mm -hmm. right? So we just need to prepare them in here. So project-based learning was on here. I could see that maybe in 13 years we're not doing that anymore. Something else came along. Technology enhanced that. But I, I think all of these fall into, these are skills that I believe our parents and our students feel, and this is coming from, you know, our ninth through, a lot of this is coming from our ninth through 12th grade students that this is what they're telling us. This is what we think is important for us to be successful in the next realm. And so now I think we have a, a responsibility to teach those things and get them ready for it. And it's substantiated by business and industry. Oh. But when Madison asked if we're going to be tracking it, and you're saying teaching, so if we're teaching it, then I, we should be tracking it. Well, I don't think we or should be necessarily it teaching it. It's just we're giving kids the opportunity to exercise and grow these types of skills alongside their academic yeah. journey, right? It's not that we're implementing curriculum to try and well, teach teachers, leadership. Teachers, or teach. Are, when they're teaching, they're looking at these six things and saying, 
That's why I want them to, 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 to come up with how are you going to, to accomplish these things throughout the year. So, you know, so that each grade level they can say, like, you know, as we're doing a project, I want to make sure I'm hitting critical thinking on this. I want to make sure that there's a communication piece to this project where they either share out to the whole group or to a small group or they do some kind of digital communication that they do that, that shows them how to do or writing a letter. You know, at a, at a, I just got a bunch of letters from fourth graders about consolidation and they were That's all great. written like in proper form <laughs> but yeah but but yeah do they are they going to need to do that in 13 years i hope so well but they should still be able to put they should still be able to put an argument together right about whether it's going to be on an email or it's going to be in a letter or it's going to be i just think it and it goes yeah. to you yeah. i still got to have a coherent thought and i have to have you know i have to know who my audience is and i have to be able to to, um, to do those things. And I'm watching a lot of these groups that I work with outside that are either leadership or service organizations or businesses, people trying to sell me. I look at all these things going on. And, and a lot of people are working from home in those industries. And a lot of them that are, are doing those jobs have um, the collaboration, the communication piece down. I don't know about some of the others, but I see that these are things that I don't, I just think no matter what period of time we go through, those, those are skills that we should have. And I think that if we're not teaching those and preparing kids for those, then they may struggle when they get into a job and, and, or into college. I mean, look at the dropout rate in college. Was it 50% of freshmen that enter college don't finish or don't finish on time? Well, maybe that's because they weren't prepared when they when they left so that is a, and i understand the academic piece isn't in here necessarily but that's that's our primary focus i mean i i think that over time all the work we've done has shown that that you know academics and when all of these i think could touch on academics yeah. you know if someone's self and goal directed or responsible sure. and things like that mm -hmm. again i just think it's uh, important how we go about cultivating these things and leading the discussion. Well, when you're in them. a classroom and you're watching who the leader is, you're not going to let that one student be the only one answering all the questions. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to always choose the same one it used to be to erase the blackboards or clean, you know, <laughs> the erasers in those days, not just be the line leader. So the way you're cultivating is really by watching what is happening. And encouraging. And encouraging other ones to do it. And, you know, the kid who hangs out in the back that, you know, that you're like, hey, why don't you be the line leader this right. week? Right, yeah. Know? Mm -hmm. But I can just say, like, even the coach and me, you know, the success we had in, in years past was because they had self goals and we had team goals. And, and, yeah. and I'm reading a book now on, you know, everyone makes a goal. I get that. Um, there's a purpose for goals, but that doesn't solve your problems, you know. Every NFL team has a goal of winning the Super Bowl. They don't all win it. So really what it comes down to is the systems that you have in your life and the systems you have in an organization, the systems you have in your classroom, those get you to your goals. And if you don't have the systems in place, it's really hard for kids to get there. And so um, I, I, I think this is, this is what I believe parents want to see when they come to our site, that we have a plan these things are important to us, and I think that based on the feedback I've received, that our parents, our students, and our staff also agree that these are things that they want to have. They were all part of the process. I hope that we get parental support on this, because like I said, 85% yeah. of the student's time is on there. Yeah. So if, if, if a student's not functioning well in one of those, yeah, we can take some of the blame, but 85% of it is at home. Oh, and that's why I think we should stick to the academics, which is what our responsibility is, not yeah. necessarily cultivating the things True. on the list. But um, in order yeah. to be good at academics, you've got to have some yeah. skills in those areas. But, but I, and I think, think that's we why we be needs... putting it forth as yeah. our response. Or what... oh, I, I, we, it is not our responsibility. Right. But, we're just but if supporting we're parents. It, then I think... but, we but can't, well, we can't teach any academics if we don't have. Well, I, I think, again, I think it needs to be more about opportunities, not lessons folks focused on these. So yeah. will it be yeah. shared publicly the ways that teachers plan to yes. encourage that leadership? Would, the leading group, when we tour a family and three kids, or whatever, they yeah. can look at that and say, this is really cool that they're going to hit on these things and my kid's going to be able to do that. That's the idea. 
But I, I will say, I, 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 academics are, are definitely important. I get that, all right? And those of you who have been around and know that it's super important to me and moving the needle in that direction is the number one priority. But if you can solve a math problem in high school, but you can't communicate and lead, that's not going to get you very far, right? It's a combination of both. You can't just say, like, well, I can do all the geometry, all the algebra, too. I can answer all these questions. But if I can't communicate, I'm not responsible, and I don't have any leadership skills, I may get hired, but I may not keep that job. And so I used to tell parents a lot of times when they were frustrated with their kids and their kids were struggling, I'd say, you know what? Your kid's going to be really successful because they got a wonderful personality. Kids, people like them. They, they light up the room when they walk in. Let's cultivate some of that. And, and I just had a parent the other day call after years and say, we got there. We're excited now. You know, we're, we made it there. So, like I said, this is not all we do, but this has got to be a focus of these are skills our kids want. And, and I listen to our kids. I've shared that. I'm very, very big on the kids. With the kids, we, we serve them. And, and with the things they need, we need to, we need to get approved. We need to get done for them. Yeah. You know, yeah. Half of what uh, we learned today will be useless information 50 years ago, mm -hmm. five years from now. Sorry. <laughs> That's my point. Well, but again, I think that these are, these are, that's these why are forever. I, these well, are skills. Well, I, well, I kind of agree, but I, I, again, I think it's important that attention isn't diverted from academics no, to no, teach no, these no, things. No, it's no, alongside it's where no. when no. in, no. you know, in academics, they're given opportunities yeah. for critical Absolutely. thinking, Absolutely. like Absolutely. debate that, or, you know, that is things like that. I can't teach without academics. You can't. Like, you can't teach a kid to be responsible if you don't have homework that they have to turn in. You can't teach them to, te you know, think critically if you don't have problems for them to solve. Mm -hmm. They walk hand in hand, so. And these yeah. are skills. They're not academics. Right. They're skills. Yes. Right. Right. But I think mean? that's why but the focus says, needs to be academic with opportunities yes. to but grow but these the skills. Is academics. Right. This, this is, is a good really discussion, bad. by the way. Yeah. I've been in a, a yeah. bunch of these, and, and this is healthy. But yeah. even it hasn't put forth a portrait of a graduate, and I don't believe oh, they have any... Oh, are you any, kidding me, right? No, they don't have anything like this. You've been to my classroom? And every as, other classroom? As I a district, yeah. I talk to the board members, they don't have anything like this. No, you're talking to the wrong person. Mm -hmm. I, I'll ask I was again. her boss. Yeah. You know I'm that, right? Saying, <laughs> they don't have... No, I, that. we don't put it, because my walls, um, my, I don't put anything on walls except practice, practice, practice. That's what I do in you programming. Really, you're not decorating like elementary no. school. No. <laughs> um, and, that, and that's a good point. And, but I can say that um, in everything we do, those skills are top of the line. And it may not be something that a board has to approve. I sure. mean, so the board just may not not be aware that it's something that's discussed amongst their staff. It just no, I know if it's not board approval. Yeah. This so. I wasn't sure. oh, oh, and Rhonda. No. Well, I've talked to Rhonda about <laughs> yeah. it. Anyway, uh, we, we all know, because our advisory committees tell us, uh, I want those. I don't care if they know how to weld. I want them to come to me with those skills. Right. And so what I've been tasked with is to, is to prepare our kids. I mean, the, the purpose of, of, our, of, of what we do, a vast majority of it is to prepare kids for their future. And if I think if you can't do these things, <laughs> I don't think right now, and I will believe in 13 years and 30 years, you're not going to have a lot of success if you can't do yeah. some of these skills. That's now, maybe you're never going to be a leader, right. but you might be the leader of your family. You might be the leader of, of, a, of another group, a social group. It may be sure, a service sure. organization. Mm -hmm. you, these are skills that, and it's not my, this isn't my skills. These are our students speaking. This is what they want. And, and th that's. Those things have been around forever. Um, call them different names, but those same elements have been part of life forever. Right? Well, I think that's part of what was concerned too. Is that like I mean I didn't grow up with this in high school, and I cultivated those. Of course you did. Yeah. Skills just because school kind of required it from you with the academics, yep. which is why well, I think that it's a concern just to have a focus on things right. that aren't academic. You know, hopefully you'll get those through osmosis. <laughs> I mean, I get most of my knowledge through osmosis. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just not a good student. <laughs>
All right, it's already 8 o'clock, um, so we're already an hour past our stop time. <laughs> we still have three more things, so um, I think that we need to move on. Yep. Um, uh, paper performance plan. Uh, yeah, so um, there's some revisions to what's been done in the past. Um, we did not make a lot of changes to it because we're respecting the work of the people before us, and um, it went through meet and confer. At least um, the things in red are changes, so you can see that um, they made a few changes here. Uh, the page 87. Uh, if you're a highly effective or effective teacher, you get 100% of that 33%. If you're developing but you're probationary, that typically means that's our young teachers and they're not going to be highly effective and effective a lot of times in their first or second year because they're still building those skills. So they are still can, can qualify for that money. However, if you're developing and you're a continuing teacher, that means you've been with us now for four to five years. And if you're not at an effective or highly effective um, level at that point, and there's some concern there and it needs to be addressed. And then finally, if you're ineffective, you get zero. Um, you can see that the only real change is I added a performance survey. This is the, the start of more to come. Um, but I do believe that as a teacher, it is important that you receive feedback from the people you serve and that it's important for you to, to hear from those, whether it's parents K-5 or it's students 6 through 12. I do believe that through feedback um, you improve your ability and you become better as a result of the feedback that comes to you. So as much as I'd like to make it mandatory, um, that's a big jump for our staff and our people. So we started it as it is a option. Um, I'd like to see it move to zone three or maybe even become in some time just who we are and what we do, but I think that is a big change for our staff and it's a scary change. And I don't wanna lose people or um, go too fast where it causes um, too much of an issue. So I think it's something we ease into. I think after they do, if they choose that piece, they might realize the value in that and, 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 uh, and improve what they do. I mean, our administration gets surveyed all the time. You guys have seen several of those presentations um, you know, we survey our parents. Um, I just think that the staff should also uh, be surveyed because um, I think there's something to gain from that. So that was one change there, and the rest is in red. I don't think there were really any other there changes. Any so, yeah. And it, if you look at this, it goes along with the portrait of the, uh, of the student in a way, because I know from teaching, I mean, some teachers are not going to do all the extra things. And you will have a decent handful that will do all of the things. So there's your leader, you know, and so on. So it does, it does go together. Are there questions about the changes on the performance plan? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Hearing none, we'll move on to the job description for the instructional coach. Yeah, I, you know, we're trying to we're trying to build instructional coaching into what we do, but we're not ready to do it at, at a level of a 1.0. Um, we just don't have the staffing to do that, and I still think there's a lot of this falls on the principals and the assistant principals to do. But I do think that there are some great teachers that have a natural ability to um, motivate others and to bring about. Um, change as needed and I, I saw that in, in several of my staff as principal um, teachers who just had a great ability to move people in the right direction so um, this is a job description that doesn't exist even though we had an instructional coach to start the year I, I, that was there when I got there the board so never approved it. I, I got you so so <laughs> so that's why I'm bringing it for approval we're not planning on putting a 1.0 but we are thinking about some six fifths uh, for a teacher who maybe does not, you know, need a prep and would like to use that prep time to go and work with some of our younger, uh, maybe more inexperienced teachers. Um, I spent a whole year last year working with the K-12, um, uh, I can't remember their full name, but they, they do induction and a lot of work with 
trying to keep teachers from the burnout process and trying to retain staff. And one of the things that has worked really well is when you have a strong instructional coach that really does work with the teachers who are struggling, um, it does make a difference. And I, I had a very strong instructional coach the last couple years, and it made um, our retention rate went to, I think, at the two schools that had it, I want to say it was 90% retention rate um, because they had that extra support because as a principal, you may not always have the time to maybe meet all those needs that a young or inexperienced teacher has. So we would uh, pick, you know, we put it out for, you know, um, you know, they'd apply for it. We'd go through the process and we would, we would hire them to do uh, more than likely six FIS contracts um, moving to start with. Um, we are looking at right now possibly one to start with and then maybe go to a second one in year two. But I'll take any questions you have. Might be a good thing at a high school with a new schedule too. Might yep. be more of an opportunity for somebody mm -hmm. to I think be it's, able to help others. Yeah, I think the instructional coach, I know a lot of other districts um, have full time oh, instructional yeah. coaches. Right. And <clears throat> for someone who's actually good at it, then, you know, it, it's definitely beneficial, especially to new teachers, because, you know, there's no, like, when teachers go to college now, there's no class anymore for, like, classroom management and, like, how, how to deal with you know, situations that happen in your class. And I think sometimes that's very overwhelming to young teachers when they're just thrown into a class of, you know, 20 kids and, um, you know, that they're not taught that. And it's not always natural to everybody. Or so. one, one that was really good that I saw is they walk yeah. them through their first evaluation process. Yeah, there you go. Like, right. you know, you're not going to be probably highly effective and that's right. okay. Yeah. And, and when I say it versus, you know, a structural coach, it, it means a little different. So, it's another resource, and I think there's a lot of things that are in the teaching profession that when you first get to that job that you you just don't think about when you're dreaming in that classroom and the preparation program of all the things you're going to do that I'm going to have to do all these other things too. And so how to manage that, um, how to, how to you know, be successful. And so we are going to have, I believe, some brand new teachers next year, and I think this helps them. And it gives them somebody to ask questions to because – I think that's intimidating to have to go to your boss and ask questions yes. and it's like, you know, maybe I should already know this. Where now you have somebody that is kind of non-biased and um, that can answer your questions. So okay. I, I think I it's great. Like okay. I know all the big districts have instructional coaches and, and many of them have, or several of the districts have many mm -hmm. of them. So It would be nice if we could actually afford a full-time yeah, one. Yeah, it's really, it's a lot easier in very large districts. To yeah. Do that. that comes with enrollment. It right. does. Right. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions or comments regarding the instructional coach position? Okay. Last up is the job description for the school counselor. <laughs> Dr. J. Yeah, so th this was um, a request, uh, I think, just to, to cl clean up what the counselor job description is at all three sites. Um, we, we have not had a counselor at the elementary in the past. We do now. We're reapplying for, you know, that to, to continue. Um, but I think a lot of the job descriptions we found in going through, you know, you just did one for ELL, uh, right, the last time. Um, there's some that just, they, they weren't, we just didn't feel met all the needs that, that, that they, they have out there. And so this just gives a little bit more scope. Uh, Kaylee worked on this, uh, took feedback, I believe, from uh, counselors and came back with this. And so... Um, I think it, it hits on, I read, you know, I went through this with her and I just, I feel like it hits more specifically what, what they need to do. And there's always other duties as assigned as well that pop up. So <laughs> that phrase is in every one of them. Right? Mm -hmm. I'd just like to see the original job description so we can Same. see the changes. Okay. And I'd kind of like to request that for any document moving forward, if we could kind of have like a red line version of changes, it would be nice. Are there any questions regarding the one that's here? Are counselors schedulers, or is that the principal's job these days? Well, they help create the schedule, for sure. Um, like, um, and they do the registration process and get all the student counts for interest in classes, and they'll help build the schedule. But, um, you know... Yeah, I, 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 I don't, I, you know, that's, that's a shared 
that's a shared job, and I think it's outlined in here that it's a shared position that they do Assist. that. Yeah. Assist. Assist. Yeah. yeah. But they do schedule changes. They do you know four-year plans. They they do things like that. But not career counseling. They do. They, it is on there. They I do. Know, but yeah. In reality, do they have? Time they do because we have because we have enough. We have a good student ratio. You know, we're only at two something per counselor. So yeah, they do a lot of helping them with college applications and job and placement. And that's a big improvement because I can go back when we had one per seven hundred. Yeah. yeah. No, the the kids actually have a lot of opportunity to meet with their counselors and talk about you know their four-year plan especially at the high school level yeah, i mean obviously sure. in middle school and stuff they're not but no the high school counselors have always been at least over the past eight years have been really great about giving the kids choices you know and having the time to do it i right. get that they all want to do that yeah but. no they they've made you know i know that when my kids were there they set up appointments actually each semester and yes. met with their counselor Excellent. and talked about it so yeah they do they've been That's great good. They meet with all freshman families to get the four-year plan started, and then they do. They meet with them throughout. And with the new advisory period that we're looking to add to the high school schedule, they will actually have, every student will have a, another adult that they see for about 20 minutes a day to keep track of their grades, their attendance, their credits, um, things of that nature that sometimes get slipped. And that's why you saw a dip in graduation rate the last year is because I don't think that stuff was being watched. And so we need to get it back to where it was before COVID. So community service too. Right. Community service, that's another one. But even just calling a, just having an adult on campus that looks after them and then having those those can those teachers can call a parent and say, I've noticed, you know, this, you know, they're on my case caseload and they haven't been to school for five days. What's going on? You know, is there anything that we can assist with? You need help with anything? Um, that that a lot of times gives keeps kids in school and keeps them coming. Absolutely. Yeah. You said we're reapplying for a grant, or mm -hmm. okay. is that through the school safety program, mm -hmm. or what grant is that? Okay. Yeah. So we didn't qualify for the expansion or the continuation grant because they never did that years ago. So there's nothing I can do about that at this time. If, but we're applying for the school safety grant, the one we currently have in place, and we are applying for three counselors and two SROs. I doubt Through the we'll, school safety program? Yeah. Okay. I doubt we'll get all of them, um, but we're going to sure try. Um, I I'm appreciate that. I'm waiting on a letter from Captain Kratzer committing to providing those SROs because without that, they won't even look at it. So, so we have a, have we submitted our application for no, the SROs? waiting on a couple of things to do. Oh, okay. And one of those is that letter. He has been very, very... Um, Easy to work with and talk to. He's on a vacation, I think, right now. But he is, um, for one, I felt comfortable that he could probably make that happen. Two, Good. might be a stretch. And when's that due? April 15th. 15th. Thank you. Okay. Any other uh, questions regarding the counselor position? Okay. Crystal, will you make sure the board gets the old job description? Thank you. Future action, um, I have uh, the social-emotional discussion actually pushed for the May agenda because April's already pretty full. Okay. Dana, I also have your preschool, um, special ed preschool on May, uh, just because in April we'll be hearing from McDowell Mountain, and I wanted preschool to do their own. <laughs> no, I, and, and it's just really I want to let everybody know how much we do when yeah. it comes to that IEP situation. Okay. I figured we did the high school, then the middle school, now we're going to do McDowell, and I wanted preschool, preschool to be able to do their own. Works for me. So, okay, so we have those items. If there's anything else, please let Kane or Krista know. Upcoming meetings, Wednesday, April 12th, we'll have our normal business meeting here. Um, April 26th, we'll have a work study session, and then we also have our special meeting on March 29th here at 5 o'clock for like 20 minutes. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> approval of two things. Fast. Don't ask any questions, Dan. No, okay. um, all right. With that, do I have a motion to adjourn? I move that we adjourn. I second. Motion carries. Whether Dana likes it or not. So, <laughs> is Kathleen Come on. Sorry, that was She's got a radio. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she's coming Thursday.